Hey, good morning. Welcome to House Department Operations. I wonder if it works. Um, 915 ish, 910 ish, 315, March 15th. We're going over uh, amended draft of H270 with Ledge Council. Uh, that's our miscellaneous cannabis bill. Um, and I realize, Michelle, thank you for waiting. I know you're on a tight clock, so I won't waste any time. Thanks. So um, I'm going to just go right into the draft. Thank you. Um, Andrea, can you let me share my screen? No, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Can everyone see that? All right. Yes. Okay. Great. So I'm just going to go over the the language that's new from the from the bill is introduced and I've highlighted the language for you and that should be on the committee web page as well. Um, so the first section, sorry, it's a little disconcerting for all the scrolling here, but um, we're going to go down to and there's a number of uh, kind of just technical amendments that I've made. For, because you've added a new type of license for the propagation cultivator. So there's a lot of places in here that are highlighted that I'm just trying to make it um, you know, jive with the, with the addition of the new uh, license. So you'll see the definition of cannabis establishment now includes propagation cultivator. Um, you now have a definition um, that applies to all the chapters with respect to the cannabis establishment regulation for a cannabis propagation cultivator. And that means a person licensed by the board to cultivate cannabis clones, immature plants, and mature plants in accordance with the provisions of the chapter. Then moving on to section four on rulemaking, there's a few things there. The first is just a technical. And then moving down to uh, a change to subdivision five with regard to rules con uh, concerning retailers. And I think the board can speak to this. Um, uh, they asked for this change uh, in response to some comments from Department of Health. And they wanted this small change on lines 20 and 21 around the, uh, the requirement that rules that the board adopts with regard to retailers um, having to do with facility inspection requirements and procedures, um, that it just be uh, that those inspections have to occur at least annually. Then now at the top of page six, you have new provisions for rulemaking for those new propagator licensees. So you see there's they need to have requirements for proper verification of age of customers. Um, they have to have rules around pesticides or classes of pesticides that can be used by those propagators. There has to be standards for indoor cultivation of cannabis, procedures and standards for testing cannabis. There have to be labeling requirements and uh, regulation of visits to the establishment and then facility inspection requirements and procedures. And these are specific just to uh, the propagators, but there is, just so you know, a very long list of rules uh, that are required with regard to all of the cannabis establishments. So if you don't see it here, if you look back up into the existing law with regard to subdivision one, it lists all the things that all, all there have to be rules for all the different types of licensees. No, thank you. You actually just answered a question, my first question. Okay. Um, so section five, um, this is uh, new, and this is addressing the issue of um, uh, records requests and what's public and what isn't. And so this is repealing the existing statute uh, or provision with regard to, um, to records. And what is uh, adopted in its place is in Section 6, which is its own new section. Um, so you see subsection A is stating the purpose of the section, which is to protect the reputation, security practices, and trade secret secrets of licensees from undue public disclosure while securing the public's right to know of government licensing actions relevant to the public health and safety and welfare. Subsection B is just clarifying that all meetings of the board are open, are subject to the open meeting law. 
Subsection C um, starts to identify the records that are exempt from public inspection. Subdivision C1, this is what is already in current law, um, which is records related to the licensee, security, safety, transportation, or trade secrets, um, including information that's provided according to their operating plan. And then the second one is records relating to investigations except for sub, subsection D. And so we'll take a look at that. So subsection D uh, relates to complaints or investigations of licensees. So you'll see with the lead-in language, if a complaint or investigation results in a formal action to either suspend or revoke, condition, reprimand, warn, fine, or otherwise penalize a licensee based on non-compliance, the case record as defined by 3 VSA 809E is to be public. And I'm just going to, um, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm just gonna show you what the case record is. Um, let's see. Thank you. <clears throat> so you see looking at title three, you'll see subsection E there. So the case record includes um, the list that you see there, I don't necessarily need to read them out to you, but I can, if you want me to, I can send the link to Andrea if you want to um, have that for the record. Yeah, please send the link. It would be a useful context. Sure. Um, so subdivision two is that um, the board is to uh, prepare uh, an aggregated list of all closed investigations into misconduct or noncompliance from whatever source. Mm -hmm. And the information contained in the list is to be a public record. The list has to contain the date, nature, and outcome of each of the complaints, but it isn't to contain the identity of the licensee unless a formal action resulted as, uh, as a, a pursuant to the investigation. And then subsection E you'll be very familiar with, which is just our standard language that we uh, add in there um, to, to make it clear that um, it continues in effect and isn't repealed um, through operation of uh, the provision for, for public records law. <clears throat> so moving on to page nine, section seven. Um, this is just a clar some clarifying language um, to make sure it's clear that cultivators, when um, they're going about their business, that they can purchase and sell seeds and immature plants, uh, not only to other licensed cultivators, but also to a propagation cultivator. On line 13, that's just a technical that I added. Um, similarly, on subdivision A3, uh, we wanna clarify that the propagation cultivator licensee, um, it, when they're required to test, transport or sell cannabis seeds that meet the federal definition of hemp, that they can, um, <laughs> do that to a licensed cultivator or a retailer or to the public. Um, next one we'll start is uh, section 12 and this is on the fee schedule. So um, there is a change that was requested from the board for manufacturers for tier one manufacturers that that uh, that fee be changed from 10,000 to 50,000 per year in cannabis products. So that's, so they have a fee of $750. And this is just changing the threshold for that $750 uh, for that, for having to pay that $750. Understood. Pardon? No, thank you. I was just saying thank you. Yep, sorry. Sure, and then um, and then there's a new fee that's added for the propagation cultivators, and so that would be five hundred dollars annually. Um, Ten is just a technical, and I think that might be it. But I just need to run. Oh, oh, there's one more here, and. Um, 
and I hope this is okay with y'all. I added this one and you had already changed, bumped out the date for the auditor's account a year because you'll see the language that struck on line 10, it was supposed to be um, due this November and it's bumping it out to 2024. And um, and so rather than just keep the November 15th date, I change it to the first just to make sure that based on once you receive the report that you have plenty of time to be able to kind of take in that report, talk about it, think about it, and in order to get meet your drafting deadline. So if you want to do some type of drafting related to whatever the auditor comes back with, that you'd have plenty of time to be able to meet the, the introduction deadlines. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Yeah, does anybody in the room have any questions for Michelle right now? Rep Morgan. Yes, thank you. What, what, what again was the big bump from 10 to 50,000 again? I forgot what we got. We saw that too, to Michelle. That's the threshold for when somebody uh, has to, is paying the fee. Let me pull that language back up, sorry. It was paid. Um, it, it's basically raising like a sales threshold. Yes, exactly. So yeah, so instead of being able to sell 10, they can go to 50. Right. Per dealer. Or so, um, so if you're a manufacturer um, uh, producing products without using solvent-based extraction, um, not more than 50, right now it's 10,000 per year, um, then it's a fee of $750. And I think this is, again, this is something that was requested by the board. So I believe when Pepper testifies, he can talk to you about their reasonings behind that. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyone else? Um, no, thank you for the time. I'm sorry we started a little late and I know you're pressed, so. No worries. The chair just arrived, so I don't know if he has anything to add to the conversation at the moment. Uh, thanks for your work on this, Michelle. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, I know that we, uh, I've heard that the Human Services Committee, they did, uh, we're calling this a drive-through, right? We're trying to get rid of drive-by. They did a drive-through uh, <laughs> of um, this bill yesterday. Um, the chair indicated she'd send me written feedback for us today um, based on their conversation. But I think, um, and I gave Michelle a heads up about this, that uh, they may have a couple tweaks uh, that we'll look at uh, this afternoon probably. So uh, trying to keep this train moving, but uh, <laughs> incorporate the feedback that we've got from our colleagues upstairs. So. Uh, we may see Michelle again later this afternoon. <laughs> and I'll, I'll join you um, a little later this morning once I'm done with my other obligations. Okay, great. That's perfect. Thank you so much, right. Michelle. Thanks. All right. So uh, we believe have an updated order here. Um, so, okay. So Bryn, are you ready to take the hot seat? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, really appreciate you being here today. Um, I apologize for me being late committee. We uh, obviously have kind of a tough drive in, especially from as far away as in Albany. So it's about a 60% longer drive than I'm used to. <laughs> Bryn, thanks for being here. Uh, take it away. Thank you for having me. So for the record, Bryn here, um, Executive Director of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board here to talk about draft 1.2 of H270, the miscellaneous cannabis bill. Um, I thought it might make the most sense just to go through the new, the changes, the highlighted yellow portions that Michelle just went through, unless you want me to start over. And no, I think that's great. If you can take us through and give us the, uh, mm -hmm. the board's perspective on and rationale for those changes, that'd be great. Sure thing. So the initial changes that are found uh, in section three, just the addition of the propagation cultivator language, um, this is the request of the board to ad add this additional license type of a cannabis propagation cultivator, and that assures that the board um, is able to give licenses to folks who just want to uh, grow some canopy to grow young seedlings, um, and that will ensure that the regulated market has a source of safe and tested um, baby plants, uh, and so we no longer have to rely on the illicit market for, for seedlings. 
Um, so that is the rationale for the cannabis propagation cultivation license. Happy to talk more about that if you'd like. Um, the change that's on the bottom of page five, this is in section four of the rulemaking section. Um, we heard some feedback from attorney Englander from the Department of Health that um, we need a statutory requirement that these cannabis established retail establishments will be inspected annually if we want to eliminate the sort of overlapping jurisdiction between the Cannabis Control Board and the Department of Liquor and Lottery for inspecting um, retail establishments that sell paraphernalia. So um, this is addressed in the sort of as introduced version of the bill, but we got some feedback that there, we don't have anything in statute that requires that we uh, inspect our retail establishments annually, although we do. Um, so this would just add that uh, add language that would actually require the board to inspect these retail establishments annually, and that will satisfy um, the requirement for the Department of Health. Is that clear enough? Okay, I'll move on to page six. Um, and this is the language about uh, the rules concerning the propagation license type. So for every license type, uh, the legislation sets forth um, a series of sort of criteria that the board needs to develop rules around. Um, the criteria that are set forth uh, here on page six about propagators are very similar to um, the requirements in rule or the requirements in statute for rulemaking around cultivation licenses. So um, similar pesticides, what pesticides are going to be used? How are we going to require that um, the license type check uh, identification to verify age standards for indoor cultivation? Um, what are the testing standards and the labeling requirements? Um, and how are how are visits to the establishments going to be monitored? Are you allowed to bring visitors? Um, and then facility inspection requirements. So it's quite a similar set of requirements for us to develop rulemaking around as what we had to do for cultivation licenses. Are there any particular, um, are you envisioning any particular rulemaking or differences in the, the sort of inspection regime for the propagation cultivation license versus the cultivator license, it seems like it's a pretty similar, the language is kind of yes, kind of a, a cut and paste for the most part, but are there any like differences we should be aware of? I don't, there are no, I think that this is essentially a cut and paste from, um, from the, the rulemaking requirements for cultivation licenses. I think that the board's sort of vision of this is that we will try to um, make these rules as uh, as like we're going to make them as unonerous as possible um, for people to be able to get in to do propagation licenses while still maintaining the integrity of like the testing requirements and labeling and age verification and things like that. But um, to the extent that these people are growing plants that are not going to go into flower, um, so there may be uh, less value associated with the young plants as opposed to the, um, the more mature plants, the security requirements and things like that will probably be less onerous than cultivation, full the full cultivation license type. So I think there are, um, and I'm, I should have done like a comparison, I think there are some um, directives to the board to make uh, security requirements by rule for the cultivation cultivation license types, and maybe that's not here. That may be one difference between the two. <clears throat> okay, um, I'll move on to section five. Um, as Michelle noted, this uh, language that struck um, on page seven is the existing language about what records are exempt from public inspection under the Public Records Act. And most of this language is just dropped down into the following section. So this is a new section that governs um, what records are confidential. And subsection A there starting on line 15 is new. So uh, the legislature tends to do um, some explanatory language about why um, it is exempting records from the public records uh, from inspection. That's the language that's found there. Um, to protect sec reputation, security practices, trade secrets of licensees from undue public disclosure, while you know balancing the right of the public to um, to know what uh, is going on that's relevant to public health, safety, and welfare. So, Nuja has a question. Sorry. Um, just curious, curious, um, is that customary for other? Like, are there other industries that that is done for, or is that 
Yes. Yeah. So this, um, my understanding is that what is, what is uh, laid out in this section is pretty similar to what exists for the Agency of Agriculture for their kind of inspections and um, investigations with respect to the people that they regulate. So I think we are seeing quite a bit of similarity between the two. Thanks. It might be a good um, question when uh, Attorney Childs comes back uh, okay. later, if you want to circle back to that and just to ask her if this is kind of standard language for mm -hmm. other similarly regulated industries. So um, top of page eight sets out the records that are exempt from public inspection. And as Michelle noted that um, that records related to licensee security, safety, transportation, or trade secrets, including information provided in an operating plan is existing language. And then um, what we've added here is records related to investigation, <coughs> except as provided in the, in the next subsection. And the request that, um, this is sort of a request from the board because as we begin to do our investigations of complaints, we are trying to balance um, what makes sense to keep confidential, what information makes sense for us to keep confidential, and what um, is important for disclosure to the public. And that, and it, this language, I think, really does try to walk that balancing line to be sure that we can um, withhold information that would compromise our investigations, um, compromise the security and safety of our licensees, um, but also be as transparent as possible about what, uh, what is happening that um, would impact public health or safety. Um, and, you know, the, I think a good example of this is um, the investigation that we recently uh, did with respect to the Holland cannabis contamination. The board, as soon as we received the complaint and um, had verification of that complaint, uh, we issued a public uh, consumer safety notice that um, warned the public about the contamination event. Um, and then as we did the investigation, we are, we are keeping the um, results of the test the test results uh, confidential until the investigation is complete, and then all of that will be made public. Okay, um, if there are no other questions about that, I'll move on to page nine. And I think, again, these are technical amendments here to just include language about the propagation cultivation license. Um, so propagation cultivator license, I think there's a change there at the bottom of page nine. Um, that would allow propagation cultivators to test, transport, sell cannabis to um, a licensed cultivator or a retailer or to the public. And I think the next change is page 12. Yeah, there was a question about this, um, about the manufacturing tier one. We have those three tiers of manufacturers. Tier one um, is, uh, is only allowed to process and manufacture using non-solvent based extraction methods. And it was originally designed to be a very um, accessible license type, which is why it's only 750. And the board capped the amount of income that that license type could bring in at $10,000. And we received quite a bit of public feedback from folks that were interested in this license type that $10,000 was not sufficient um, and that 50,000 would be uh, a more representative cap on where where they would wind up um, with this type of license. So we are responding to that and raising the cap to 50,000. Manufacturing tier two has the same, can do the same types of extractions, just doesn't have the, doesn't have the total um, income cap. So um, next change on the same page sets the annual licensing fee for propagation cultivators at $500. Um, and this is, again, designed to be an accessible license type. But we really set, uh, are proposing that fee um, in comparison with some of our other fees that we have recommended. So the Tier 1 outdoor cultivation license type costs $750. So this would be you know, a step down from that. So it would be the least expensive license type. Next change, I think, is a um, technical amendment. <clears throat> Um, I do have one uh, additional request, a little tweak um, that I am, the board is requesting on page 16. I can follow up with Michelle about this. This uh, page 16, this is the caregivers section and it's relevant to the new language that would um, remove the uh, fingerprint supported background check requirement and instead require the check of the child protection registry and the um, vulnerable adult registry. 
there was, if you look at page 16, section C, starting on line five, um, there's existing language that requires the board to adopt rules and set out standards for determining whether a caregiver should be denied um, a place on the caregiver registry if, um, because of their, their criminal history record or the applicant status on either registry. And his or her criminal history record was struck there. Um, and it was pointed out to us that it, it makes sense that the board should be able to make these determinations about whether a caregiver should get a card also based on their criminal history, history record and not just their status on the registry. Otherwise, why would we be requiring a, a criminal history record check at all? So just so, so is the, I just want to know what to ask uh, legislative council. So your recommendation is that we just um, after the applicants include criminal history record and or status on actually that? even simpler. It's just to unstrike his or her criminal history record. Yeah, the problem is we're removing that we do his or her, yes. language. So okay. I just want to make sure it reads right. So we're going to keep criminal history and remove the gender yes. <laughs> on that's line five of 16. That's right. It's line seven. Seven. Yeah. Yes. And I'm happy. Seven, seven into eight. Right. I'm happy to follow. Oh, up. yeah. It starts the clause starts at on line five. So it's <clears throat> in a, uh, correct. C. No. I think we're all saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just uh, just want to make sure we, uh, we don't. Uh, so let's uh, remove that strike. Okay. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Representative Hooper. Representative Hooper, sorry. Make my notes here. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, now I remember <clears throat> what my issue was. Um, are we looking inside or outside quarters for that history? It's the, I believe that the language just sets out our um, Vermont criminal history record check. That kind of was my problem. Somebody that popped across the border to start to do this, we have no history on them. Is that an issue? So let me, I'm just verifying connected Vermont criminal history record check, right? Um, so I, you know, I think that's a consideration for the committee, whether, um, a person who is crossing the state lines to commit a crime and then coming back, if that's a, if that's a genuine concern of the committee, you know, I would just reiterate what I think we mentioned the first time we were here is that really the vast majority of these caregivers are family members, mm -hmm. um, that are, that are like providing care to a, to a sick child or a sick spouse. Um, so I think that, uh, there, it, there doesn't appear to be a real industry like for caregivers. Um, it really seems to be like either close, close friends or family that are providing the service. Sure, in its, in its youth, I suppose, but as folks creep in everywhere. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> you know, under this under this language, somebody could get out of jail in the morning in Albany and come over and apply for a Bennington caregiver situation and probably pass the background check in Vermont. Well, um, you know, I think that the what the board has really been focused on in our criminal history record checks um, are the types of crimes that would, would indicate that the person was a threat to um, the safety of the person that they are supposed to care for. Um, so, I, you know, for the, for example, um, the criminal history record checks that we do in the adult use licensing, um, the board set out rules that indicated that if a person had um, committed the types of crimes that indicated that they were probably uh, participating in the illicit cannabis market, that that wouldn't necessarily preclude them from um, joining the regulated market. So I imagine um, with respect to the rules around caregivers, we would be similarly positioned to really try and look carefully at what uh, what would actually impact, um, what types of crimes would actually indicate that the person would not be an appropriate caregiver. And whether or not, uh, you know, if the committee feels strongly that we should be doing a, a full 50 state uh, background check on these folks, then we could leave the, the FBI um, fingerprint supported background check there. Um, I think we were really just trying to reduce the administrative burden on these folks that are really primarily um, parents and, and friends of people who are pretty sick in the state. 
Can I just ask, because I think, I think what um, the word caregiver implies a lot of kind of power and responsibility. Um, and, and I think it might help if you could just remind us that we talked about this a couple weeks ago. What, what is the power that a caregiver has in this context? Like, what are they actually allowed to do on behalf of the person who's on, on the registry? Grow plants for them. Um, if uh, many of our patients, you know, are, are too sick to engage in the cultivation of cannabis, so they're allowed to grow plants for them. They're also allowed to um, go to the dispensary and pick up medication for the patient. Um, and that's pretty, it's a pretty limited set of, uh, Set of things they're allowed. Yeah, I would also administer. Phrased question: Maybe what's the potential of what they can do uh, once you get into a situation where you're trusting and dependent upon somebody that has intended you to grow outside the boundaries of maybe this particular relationship into other ones? Um, I would be more comfortable if we recognized that somebody that came into the state with less than a year's worth of history here went through a different procedure, not necessarily somebody who's been a family member or involved in an intimate circle with the individual, but when you start dealing with people who you know, have no history, it's pretty hard to assess what their history has been. So you're saying like a residency threshold? Yeah. Or just like a different screening process depending on how long you've yeah. been a state resident. Yeah, I just wanted to try this process. Here's the maybe. Elderly abuses. Well, yeah, how many people who are requiring care? Elderly, I guess, is a question I would have if that's your focus. Like, what percentage of the patient population utilizing a caregiver or elderly. I don't know if that's any data that the board has. We can. You know, I, I hate to sound like a pessimist or something, but one person is too many because we didn't do something to prevent it at this stage. Yeah, so I guess what I'm, what is kind of zooming back. So um, designation as a caregiver allows that adult to sort of ride on and facilitate the, the patient's medical privilege, privileges of being on the medical registry. There's, there's nothing that would stop an adult now that we have the, the adult use retail market from going and purchasing cannabis and giving that to somebody else if their if they, if they desire was to do something criminal, right? So. What we're doing, what we're saying here is that we're lowering the threshold a bit for those folks who have a caregiver relationship and just making it easier for people to facilitate the purchase or the grow for folks who are on the medical registry. And so I'm, I still am trying to get at, I, I think there is the desire, the, it is reasonable to have a certain level of um, background check, but I'm, I'm also wondering like sort of what, what we're trying to prevent. I think if there's a, if there's a specific suggestion, given the, the amount of testimony we want to take today and the, the lateness that we're at, that we either, that this is a real deal breaker and we need to keep the more stringent 50 state background check or that we have, that we have a bifurcated system. I mean, I guess or if, that's a, if that's a path to alleviate Representative Cooper's concern for us to say, for folks who have lived in Vermont for more than a year, this is sufficient, but for those who haven't, who have a recent residency in Vermont, and we'd like them to go to the full check um, if that's something that would sort of square the circle. <laughs> yeah, we could, um, you know, I'm thinking about how we would administer that. Uh, we could certainly ask um, if we were, uh, if, depending on how the legislature wanted this language to look, um, we may have to do some sort of investigation ourselves as to whether or not the person has lived in Vermont for the last year or has lived in other places because if it were just if we just asked them um, yeah. I'm not sure that would be sufficient my so. concern is we're through this instrument we're creating uh, a state sanctioned 
sort of thing. And we should make sure the state sanction is protected as much as possible. And I recognize that it's outside the realm of the actual relationship that we're sanctioning, possibly. Try to figure out a, a way to expeditiously address your concern. <laughs> my brain is yeah, yeah, yeah. moving on no, really fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm down to like. Well, we'll get in. I work with music right now. Um, I guess for me, it would be helpful to have some clarity around the access that these caregivers have to their the people they're taking care of. Like, are they? Is it like a delivery driver, or are they in their homes? You know, like with access to. Them? you know, their whole life thing, or is it a variety, I guess? I think that it is, it does represent a variety of relationships. Um, the, we don't specify in rule, like what the nature of that relationship has to be. I think that for some people, they go and pick up their medicine and they bring it back and they help administer it in their home. Um, and for other people, it may be more of a delivery type service, somebody who is no longer able to drive, for example. Um, so I do think there's a, it represents a variety of different like factual situations. So we have um, some more testimony from caregivers and folks who are involved in uh, cannabis patient care uh, coming right up. So um, let's keep thinking about this a little bit and we can come back to it um, later this morning in that testimony and committee discussion. Okay. That makes sense. So that is the last thing that I have um, except for the change of date for um, the auditor report, which I think you already decided on, so I don't think that's a real change. Um, great. Well, Bryn, thank you for being with us. Uh, and I hope you'll stick around and, and hear what other folks have to say in case we need the board's response to some of the further testimony and committee discussion. Yes, I will say it until Patrick can arrive. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so we have a number of folks uh, who are going to be uh, um, giving us some testimony this morning. Um, I've uh, invited uh, people who have requested to testify um, and have many different perspectives. Um, some are uh, represented patients, uh, caregivers who are, are involved in therapeutic use of cannabis. Um, there's uh, a couple of folks will be testifying that are representing um, cultivators of different types. And um, I've asked folks to try to keep their testimony uh, time, you know, within the, the bounds of 10 or 15 minutes if possible um, because of our tight timeline and also uh, to stay focused on the topics that we're considering in H270. I know there are a lot of different uh, cannabis policies being discussed in the public elsewhere in the building. Uh, it's crossover week. I've committed to continue to have uh, room for and be open to more expansive policy conversations after crossover, especially in the context of bills that may or may not come over from the Senate. Uh, but for now, I'm trying to stay focused on H270. So I just wanted to frame up some of our further testimony uh, that way. Uh, so I'll be trying to put a little, little bit of gentle bumpers on some of the conversation uh, if we kind of veer way off topic. Um, but I want to invite um, Amelia Grace from the Green Mountain Patients Alliance. Uh, Amelia, are you there on Zoom? I am. Great. Uh, well, thanks for being with us today and, and uh, being willing to testify. And so, yeah, please uh, absolutely. share your perspective with us. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just pull up my prepared testimony. All right. Good morning, everybody. I hope you made it into work safely. Um, thank you, Chair McCarthy, for inviting me to speak today. My name is Amelia Macy, and I'm a patient and advocate and the co-founder of Green Mountain Patients Alliance. I'm here today to speak specifically to the medical policies addressed in Bill H-270 as they pertain to the patient experience. Um, I'd like to start with a little bit of background on myself. Uh, in 1999, at the age of four, I was diagnosed with an incurable condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This is a connective tissue disorder that causes thin skin that bruises and tears easily, joints that are loose and spontaneously dislocate, as well as comorbidities that affect my organs, immune and nervous systems. On top of that, I have Crohn's disease um, and I deal with you know, the mental effects of a lifetime of medical related trauma. The first point I'd like to touch on is the proposed language to expand the qualifying conditions to receive a medical card. 
As it's currently written, patients who are diagnosed with one of the approved conditions or with a disease or medical condition or its treatment that is chronic, debilitating, and produces the symptoms of Caxiar wasting syndrome, chronic pain, severe nausea, or seizures qualifies for a medical card. I would propose that rather than continue with a list of conditions that patients will have to appeal to have updated with their own, we move to a symptom-based qualification system. Ramon already recognizes four symptoms as qualifiers, but replacing the existing conditions with the symptoms we recognize cannabis is used to relieve will expand registry access to thousands of currently unregistered patients. For example, cannabis has been known to relieve anxiety, depression, and panic attacks in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, but those three symptoms are not qualifiers on their own, even though the state recognizes the value of that relief in PTSD. My suggestion is that Vermont look into why certain conditions qualify for medical cards and how each of those conditions share symptoms with numerous other diseases that could be relieved with cannabis. Moving to a symptom-based model would not only increase access to the registry, but it would also give healthcare providers clearer guidelines to verify that their patients are finding tangible relief through cannabis. When I was approved for my card at the age of 19 in 2014, it was under the symptom of chronic pain because Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, something that is both incredibly painful and degenerative, is not on the conditions list. In H270, you seek to add ulcerative colitis and IBS to the conditions list, which I absolutely believe deserve to qualify for a card. However, Crohn's already qualifies for a card and shares a majority of symptoms with both UC and IBS. Under a symptom-based model, all chronic GI disorders would qualify without needing to go through the process of individually approving every single one. Also in H270, um, you seek to exclude chronic pain from the annual renewal exemption. I would just remind you that many conditions not listed as qualifying, including mine, have chronic pain as a symptom, and excluding those folks punishes them for needing to settle on the closest qualifier possible, meaning they might have an incurable or long-term condition, but because their condition is not listed, they then have to fall back on chronic pain. So that uh, excluding them doesn't really make sense there. Um, moving on to the proposed plant count increase, I firmly believe that we need to do away with numerical immature plant caps and replace that with a canopy allowance of 250 square feet for immature plants. Capping the number of immature plants someone can have also places a limit on the number of mothers, clones, and seedlings someone can have at once. This means that folks will have less genetic diversity in their own grow and will take a lot longer to find cultivar and terpene combinations that do the best job of relieving their symptoms. In short, limiting genetic diversity also limits symptom relief potential. Six mature plants is also not enough for many patients who make their own concentrates and edibles with the flower those plants produce. I would recommend increasing this number to 12 mature plants and a square footage canopy allowance for immature plants rather than a set number. Regarding the caregiver amendments, um, I agree that caregivers should be able to serve multiple patients, but patients also need to have multiple caregivers. There are many examples where this would apply and Green Mountain Patients Alliance is currently recommending a system where caregivers may care for three patients, patients may have three caregivers, and both can circumstantially apply for more on a case-by-case -case basis with approval from the CCB. Patients who are minors will automatically need multiple registered caregivers to relieve parents of the burden of a single family member being the only one in the house who can administer cannabis 24 seven. Increasing the amount of caregivers that a patient can have also protects that patient in the instance that one of their caregivers experiences crop failure, especially in the outdoor season in Vermont. And that would ensure that the patient still has medicine should that occur. I'd also like to touch on um, Representative Hooper's concerns about the background check, um, there really isn't any incentive in Vermont to become a caregiver. There is no money involved. Nobody's getting paid for this. It is largely done out of charity um, so that patients can afford their medicine. And while I understand the concern that somebody could come in from out of state and get a, a caregiver card fairly quickly, from that point on, there really is no benefit to that person. 
it just it doesn't really make sense to think that somebody could be trying to take advantage of a system where there's there's no benefit to them monetarily. Um, medical cannabis reform should be patient centered. Throughout the history of Vermont's medical program, the state has failed to take into account patients' lived experiences. I've been navigating the healthcare system, advocating for myself and educating doctors about my condition for 23 years, longer than a lot of healthcare professionals have even been practicing. My firsthand experience and the experiences of thousands of Vermont patients should hold just as much weight as the opinions of doctors and their lobbyists. I'm no longer a registered patient on the Vermont Medical Cannabis Registry. The program did not evolve in a way that supported my needs, but that does not stop me from being a patient and finding relief through cannabis. There are thousands, and, and I have to stress, thousands of unregistered patients in our state who either do not qualify for the program or do not see value in what it offers. And we can make real tangible changes to this program that will make life better for the most vulnerable people in our community. But in order to do that, those changes need to vastly increase access to the registry and once registered needs to address the individual needs of each patient via caregivers who can provide the one-on-one -on -one care that a dispensary simply can't. So in summary, I'm asking you to do three things today. One, adopt a symptom-based qualification model for obtaining a medical card rather than condition-based. Two, increase the patient and caregiver plant count to 12 mature plants with a square footage canopy allowance of 250 square feet for immature plants. And three, allow caregivers to care for three patients, for patients to have three caregivers, and allow both to circumstantially apply for more on a case-by-case -case basis with approval from the CCB. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Amelia, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, so I, I wanted to, my first question, and, and then I'll go to the committee, is that what, what I heard from some of our colleagues outside of the room yesterday who have looked at the um, conditions versus symptoms is that there was a, a sense that the falling back on the broader uh, symptom-based language that's in what's, you know, current statute, paragraph C, a disease or medical condition or its treatment that is chronic, debilitating, et cetera, that that, that symptom-based catch-all in that paragraph sort of alleviated the need to continue to list out more conditions. And I'm wondering if you could, I don't share, have that perspective, but I heard that perspective from a couple of other members outside of the room yesterday. So I'm wondering if you feel like, and it sounds like you do, that, that we're, we still uh, don't have a broad enough symptom-based set of qualifications, even though we do sort of approach that in, in existing statute. Absolutely. Um, there are many symptoms that are unique to certain conditions, um, but there are also symptoms that aren't listed that share amongst a bunch of the conditions that are listed. Um, for example, insomnia, um, anxiety, depression, like I said before, panic attacks, um, and with respect to ulcerative colitis and IBS and Crohn's, there are gastrointestinal symptoms that all of those share um, that are also shared with dozens of other diseases. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think I need to explain to you all that over the last 10 years, we've only added two conditions to the list. Um, and both times it's because a patient has had to take the initiative to come in and appeal for their condition to be added. And if we keep doing this like this, it's gonna take us years, years, to actually have an amount of conditions that covers even the majority of patients in Vermont. Whereas if we switch to a symptom-based model, we can expand that access so much faster. Any other questions for Amelia? Well, thank you so much for your testimony, Amelia. I appreciate you joining us today. No problem. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Jessalyn Dolan. Jessalyn, are you there? Yes, thank you so much. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us. 
Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I want to thank Chair McCarthy for allowing me to speak and be here today. For the record, my name is Jessie Lynn Dolan, and I'm here on several fronts. I'm a registered nurse specializing in addiction, mental health, and chronic pain. I was formerly the nurse director at Lund inpatient and outpatient, as well as the school nurse at SOAR through Northwest Counseling Services. I'm the former director of the American Cannabis Nurses Association. I'm the current president of the American Nurses Association here in Vermont for all nurses. And I'm the founder of the Vermont Cannabis Nurses Association. With Amelia, I'm a co-founder of the Green Mountain Patients Alliance, which is part of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition with the Racial Justice Alliance, Vermont Growers Association, Rural Vermont, and NOFA. We work collaboratively together on all our recommendations and requests. I'm a cannabis patient myself for chronic pain, having had over three dozen surgeries as a child, and I ironically have the same genetic connective dis disorder, Ehlers-Danlos, that Amelia uh, mentioned, as well as being a sexual abuse survivor with PTSD. Without cannabis as medicine, I would be on, a, on disability and half a dozen or more addictive and debilitating pharmaceuticals. I am able to be a nurse and help other people because of cannabis as medicine. I've been a cannabis caregiver for another nurse in cancer remission for years. So I'm here to speak to you today about the many needs for patients and caregivers in our medical program and how together, hopefully we can support these positive changes with Bill H-270. I did submit my testimony and I wanna continue with that, but I do wanna address one thing that we were speaking here today off the cuff. So speaking to the perception of being, uh, that's being spoken to about caregivers, um, the representative speaking, I think, is ha has some misunderstanding and misinformation and is a bit biased. I want to I want you guys to remember that nobody becomes a caregiver to grow illegally and then sell to the black market. If they wanted to do that, they wouldn't sign paperwork with the state of Vermont allowing uh, someone to come in and audit or search their property at any time. Please recognize that caregivers, myself as a caregiver, we care and patients do and can benefit from caregivers. And the testimony I'm here, hearing today is a little disheartening and almost feels like it's being criminalized. So if we could leave some time to address this at the end of my testimony or the end of today, I would really appreciate that because I am a bit saddened by the assumptions that are being made of the concerns around caregivers and would love to continue to address that more. But I do want to finish the rest of my prepared testimony I have for you. I wanted to start by applauding you for adding several new medical conditions to the current list of conditions that are allowing medical cards to be signed for. As a medical professional, I'm in support of changing from a disease-based quali qualification system to a symptom-based. I would ask you to please consider trusting medical professionals and allowing them to make the determination as to who is appropriate to recommend for medical cannabis, just like we do uh, with uh, providers who provide Suboxone to the correct people, rather than them only being able to if the patient's disease is already listed as allowable per legislation. So please consider changing to a symptom-based system. And again, I do thank you for the additions you've added. Thank you for lo also looking to remove the mandate for patients with PTSD to need two signatures. As a nurse and a patient with PTSD, I know all too well that traditional therapy is not the answer for everyone, that not everyone can even find a therapist right now, and not every therapist has education with cannabis. So that, uh, that extra signature is just another barrier for treatment. I'll ask you to please work with the CCB so that patients with chronic diseases do not need to apply for their medical card annually. My genetic disorder, the same one Amelia has, is never going away, unfortunately, yet I have to reapply every year. And for the chronically ill, this is an undue burden. I'd like to speak to increasing the plant count limitations. So I'd like to share a quick personal story. Several years ago, I immediately needed a lumpectomy for a concerning breast lump and only had two days to prepare for surgery. I needed concentrated cannabis oil and after surgery for the pain. So to make enough of my own concentrated medicine to not need opioids after surgery, I needed about half a pound of cannabis flour, which equates to one, if not two, entire indoor harvests and a minimum of three or four months of my growing time. So two plants is not enough cannabis for people who need higher doses of cannabis like surgery. I think it's important for you to understand the quantity of cannabis needed to treat con certain conditions and make certain products such as concentrated oil and how one surgery literally utilized a quarter of my annual cannabis medicine. It was made even worse when due to being rushed and nervous before surgery, I ended up burning my own medicine, even with the experience I have, wasting half a pound of cannabis and didn't have more cannabis to replace it because of that two plant limit. 
Patients and caregivers need more than two plants when growing and making their own medicine for so many reasons. Outdoor grows, which are much more common, easier and more affordable, are only allowed, allotted one harvest a year. One harvest with two plants is not very supportive and helpful for patients, and more people grow outside as inside. If you, um, if you only harvest a few ounces per plant a few times a year or once outdoors, two plants can be detrimental. If the plants aren't clean or healthy enough, people need to be able to destroy them knowing they have others, knowing they're allowed more than two. We need to help make cannabis medicine affordable and growing your own is one way to do so, but two plants isn't even close to enough. Having been a cultivating caregiver for another nurse for a long time, because she couldn't cultivate herself because her husband was in the military here in Vermont. I understand the trials and tribulations of growing. A cultivator needs some wiggle room to destroy, or destroy a plant if it's not as healthy or clean as a patient needs. Growing isn't as easy as everyone thinks and has a big learning curve for many. There can be pests and disease that attack the plant. So rather than trying to save or salvage the plant material, which we see all too often, caregivers need to know they can destroy that crop and start over to ensure cleanliness and safety for the patient. If caregivers could have the assurance that patients have access through a higher plant count, and even better, another cultivating caregiver on the team, we could help ensure that level of comfort and, again, safety for the patient. So we need to increase the amount of caregivers per patient. We need caregivers to be allowed to support more than one patient as well. I'd ask you, why not? We need to put patients first before prohibition and before biases and stigmas. As a nurse, I want you to consider what having one or even only two caregivers means and how that is a setup for burnout. The burden placed on that one caregiver 24 seven, 52 weeks a year, usually family is the one that has to be that caregiver and also pick up the work slack and the other responsibilities of their ill family member. This is actually inhumane. As baby boomers will need more care, we desperately need this to happen to avoid burnout and secondary trauma amongst family and caregivers. So please remember that not that many people don't use cannabis or end up back on their pharmaceuticals and opioids because they can't afford cannabis. Cannabis is not affordable for patients and cultivating caregivers can help bridge that gap. Uh, bridge that gap excuse me. So please increase the plant count to 12 flowering, the caregiver count to three, and patient count to three. Please also join us in asking the CCB to work on a price management system for patients at the dispensary to make cannabis more affordable and accessible. So in summary for today, I ask you to please consider adopting a system-based qualification model of support and support the removal of the second sign-off needed for PTSD. I ask you to remove the necessity that patients with chronic diseases reapply annual and increase the pa patient and caregiver plant count to 12 mature plants with unlimited vegetation or the great idea Amelia just gave you with a 250 foot square foot cap. Allow caregivers to care for three patients, for patients to have three caregivers with CCB discretion for more. Lastly, and one I feel so passionately about is to allow patients access to shop at adult use retail shops without paying extra taxation. Patients drive from Newport to Burlington and would rather shop and support local. There's no reason patients should not have access to adult use without paying exorbitant taxes. Many adult use retailers are shouldering the cost for patients by covering their taxes and shouldn't have to. Please, please allow patients to shop at adult use retail without exorbitant taxation. This could be an enormous support for our patients. And I'd ask you to discuss this with me and other patients more. So please include our testimony, healthcare providers, patients, caregivers. Yesterday, I believe medical was taken up without grassroots patients or caregiver voices. So please consider allowing us to speak and to listen to our words, as well as looking to have a medical professional on the medical program team with the CCB. Thank you for your time and please feel free to ask me any questions or if there is more time, I would love to address the concerns around caregivers even more so. Thank you so much. Questions for Jessalyn? Representative Waters Evans. Thank you. Um, hi, I am wondering, I don't know if you can answer this question or not, um, but Amelia said that often a healthcare provider will, or or she referenced something about how a healthcare provider will um, just use chronic pain as like a catch-all for, you know, conditions that are 
mentioned in the law. And I was wondering if you have any idea or concept of how often this occurs or, or if it's like a prevalent thing amongst healthcare providers to just kind of use that as a, as a reason when they can't fit whatever the symptoms are into a different box that's, that's not legally allowed. Absolutely. I do feel that is what I, you know, what is happening, what I've heard from both patients and caregivers that if they do medicinally feel that cannabis is a safe and good option for them, that they have to find, you know, the way to make it work. So check off the right checkbox, putting in the right diagnosis instead of saying, yep, th this would benefit the, con the symptoms that you're having. And we know you're using cannabis already to support those symptoms. So I do think we see that. I think it's also great and important for you guys to know, unfortunately, the truth of reality is that cannabis education is not in nursing school. It's not in medical professional schools. And here in the state of Vermont, we don't have any mandated education regarding that. So we are also looking to you know, help educate and have our healthcare professionals understand and work a little bit more as far as educating themselves to be more supportive for our patients here in the state too. So thank you, that's a great question. But yes, unfortunately, I think it is being lumped into chronic pain a little bit too much. Um, and we, if we could expand that, I think we would see some positive feedback from providers and patients. Um. Jessalyn, the way that the bill is currently drafted, um, I, I wanted to sort of segue into a little bit of um, the conversation we were having and, and your testimony about caregivers, um, is that additional caregivers shall be at the discretion of the board. So, you know, where it says a, a patient who is under 18 years of age can have two give, caregivers, I'm assuming that that, that just covers uh, patients who are minors can have at the discretion of the board more caregivers, but we've, we've limited that um, for adults. I would ask you not to limit that to pediatrics at all. When you think about a time frame of a 40 hour work week, you need multiple caregivers to be caring for that patient if they need round the clock care. Or as Bryn mentioned, sometimes it's somebody helping a patient administer their own medicine. So if we have one caregiver playing that role 24 seven, as I mentioned, we are looking for burnout. We have a lot of people moving into that baby boomer and that elderly needing support phase of life. And if it's one caregiver and they're only available 40 hours a week, that patient isn't getting what they need. If we're expecting that caregiver to work 27, you know, 24, seven, seven days a week, again, we are setting them up for failure, which is then a detriment to the patient themselves to have a caregiver who is literally burning out. And as we, as I've mentioned, as we age and get to this stage where we have a lot of baby boomers who want to use cannabis instead of opioids and other harsh chemicals, if we don't have a support system with caregivers readily available instead of burning out, we are not doing our job protecting and supporting our patients. Other questions for Jessalyn? Representative Nugent. Hi, um, I'm just curious if you can kind of give us a sense of like what that looks like on a day to day basis for a caregiver. Um, just thinking about like dosages and how long um, it would last, like what that looks like. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, so it really depends on the form of cannabis medicine they're using. When you think of using edibles, that is the medicine that lasts the longest in your system. So hopefully four to eight hours, cannabis medicine can work for, for an edible to be effective. If it's a disease process such as spastic pain or um, you know IBS, something that comes on quickly, usually most people would administer either vaping or smoking. To have that work consistently, that's often a product people would administer every one to two, maybe even three hours as needed. If we have a patient that needs a caregiver because they can't physically do that, the work of getting that medicine ready for themselves, we are leaving patients every two to three hours to figure out 
how to administer their own medication rather than having someone available to help them. So essentially the way I look at this is I've mentioned I've been a school nurse before. 40 hours a week, I'm there with that child. Who's taking care of that child, whether it's a child again or an elderly person, because we are we do know elderly folks need the support to use cannabis medicine instead of other pharmaceuticals if that is their option. They have, a, we have three shifts a day, seven days a week when you look at a nursing staff and shifting, right? That is what a caregiver is. It is essentially someone helping to support their person, their patient, their family with medical support. That should be seven days a week, three people a day in shifts, unless we want to expect one caregiver to do all of that work. The same caregiver that likely also needs a job to be able to afford their patient to to access to this medicine and for them to continue to have their other supports in place. So when we look at dosing, mm -hmm. it really is unfortunately, but fortunately, because there are a lot of options based on which medication they're using, but even if they are using the most long active cannabis medicine, they would need someone to administer that at least four times or more a day. And just asking one person to do that is asking someone to work full time round the clock without a day off ever. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, Jessalyn. I really appreciate you bringing the, the perspective of a medical professional who is working with cannabis because that's an important one, I think, to have in this conversation. So very much appreciate your testimony. Um, I think we're in the bill moving in the direction uh, on a couple of those, those pieces and probably not going to satisfy all the requests that both you and Amelia have, have brought up before crossover today. Um, but I think as we think about the evolution of the medical cannabis market alongside the nascent retail market. We're going to have to continue to be in dialogue with you to make sure that we're um, serving patients well. I mean, I, I think we're obviously we're trying to solve in H270 some of the immediate concerns that you brought up, uh, but I don't think our work is going to stop there. So I want to say that for folks who are not going to be satisfied by what this bill uh, gets across, um, that we're, we're not done these conversations. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciate both you and Amelia bringing that perspective. Oh, thank you for having us. And we appreciate your openness to have conversations again in the future. All right. Um, so uh, next, uh, we're going to be hearing from Jesse Lucas. Would you like to take the hot seat since you're here in person? Thanks for joining us today for your patience with the starting late and the snow and the craziness that <laughs> the <crazy> <laughs> <now>. <laughs> weather brings. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair McCarthy, for inviting me down to be able to speak today and all the fellow members of this committee for hearing us on our testimony this morning regarding H270. Um, for the record, my name is Jesse Lucas. I am the co-owner of Boreas Ventures. I also own, own a small organic certified farm in Charlotte called GMG Farms. On our farm, we produce vegetables throughout the four seasons, along with herbs, flowers, berries, other agricultural crops and plants, which include certified organic hemp flour. I have done this for several years, and in 2002, we obtained a social equity outdoor cannabis cultivation license from the state of Vermont to grow cannabis with a higher THC than a normal hemp license would allow. This is the only one difference between hemp and cannabis that's found in the used market. This one, <clears throat> the percentage of this one cannabinoid in this plant that makes that one difference. Everything else is the same, the smell, the look, they grow the same dry, cure, package, all the same way. This leads me to my dilemma as a farmer currently. I work all season to grow our cannabis flower on my farm, in the ground, with sunlight, next to all my other plants, which I can sell to the public myself, but yet I am handcuffed to sell my cannabis flower to a third party who has no obligation to even purchase what I have to offer. I would like to be able to sell our cannabis flower and products from our farm, like any other farm that is able to offer these pro their produce, meat, or other agricultural products at their location. We have this ability to do it now with everything else that we sell. Please allow us to advocate for our own cannabis flower and not be limited to a third party. Regarding the propagation license as defined in H270, which I've been invited to speak here, 
Um, the market is still in its infancy and the current structure is slanted towards the intermediaries. Now is the time to balance out this intermediary heavy structure by expanding allowances for producers, cultivators, and manufacturers. Now is not the time to introduce yet another license, which further risks pushing the market into another intermediary dominated one. Um, Cultivators are likely the group most interested in selling seeds and living plants. They should not be asked to spend more time and money on another license when we can simply allow them to sell their products in a safe and regulated manner, which we already do with all of our other products. And we are allowed to sell clones. We are allowed to sell seeds to other cultivators. We just can't do it to the public. So I have an issue with this. Um, I guess, you know, I, you know, there's a, there's a gray area here for us cultivators when it comes to selling seeds and living plants. Some licenses are doing this now, some are not. Lawmakers are here to remove uncertainty from the market. You know, in January 2022, the federal government abandoned the source rule for sourcing cannabis seeds and living plants and will instead use the THC threshold as defined in the Farm Bill. The propagation license as defined in H270 will only serve to reinforce this gray area, such that if enacted, cultivators without this propagation license will likely continue to sell seeds and living plants directly to the public, as it is occurring now. It is only important to explicitly allow licensed cultivators to sell seeds living plants to the public, not only because it is the most healthy option for licensees in the state market, but it also to eliminate this gray area and remove the uncertainty currently being cast over us growers. We are farmers. We grow plants. Plants are agriculture. We are an agricultural state. I have a farm in an agricultural town that currently says I need a special conditional use permit to grow a plant in the ground on my farm. Let's change all these mistakes. Let's allow cannabis to be under the umbrella of agriculture. Let's embrace this new crop and work to educate the public together. I'm here today because I care about what I put into my body. I care because I have lost confidence in some of our systems that say they're looking out for my best interests. I produce organic soil grown agricultural crops. Can we please allow cannabis to be considered the same? I would love to hear any questions from you. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thanks for being with us. So, uh, so just within the function of the uh, of H270 with the words on the on the on the page. Um, so you're saying right now, like with your cultivation license, the ability to sell starts essentially, mm -hmm. uh, which the propagation license would allow. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I have a couple of questions here. Um, if it's actively occurring with people who currently have cultivation licenses, is that just them not understanding the structure of their license? Sure, there could be some confusion there. Yeah. Okay, so that's like more of an education problem. Yeah, there's a lot of education. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're still in the infancy of all of this, and yeah. there's a lot of education to take place. Yeah. So, I agree. Yeah. Okay, um, and then within the the issues that you're talking about at the town level. Um, I mean, that's not something that we were necessarily addressing in here. Now, I'm, t I'm definitely aware of it. I'm from, I'm from Virgins. I'm in a budding district to you. Sure. Um, so I have certainly heard about a lot of this stuff. I've, I, I've worked within the conversations. This is my first year in the, in the Committee of Jurisdiction for Cannabis Control sure. and the market, but it is something I've been in discussion with my entire life, so I'm not foreign to the concept. Um, so ultimately, with that, property you know with that with that municipal conversation um i just unfortunately don't think that's something we have time to address here we've been having conversations with other folks so i just want to let you know that that's not something that's being glossed over sure. it's definitely an active conversation we were discussing it just this week um so with the propagation conversation so essentially like what does your vision of how you could sell to the public off of your property look like? Because I'm trying to get a firm understanding of that for people. Sure. I mean, we have we sell plants already. We sell vegetables. We are currently looking at being able to build, you know, a small farmer's market on, not a farmer's market, a farm stand, essentially, to be able to sell all of these from. But on a municipal level, we're sort of running into sort of this backup against we have this one plant that sort of is not defined and it's causing a lot of confusion. And as a cultivator, to be able to sell plants to the public, I think that's in our interest and the public's interest. It's less hands touching everything. It's also coming directly from us. I guess we're giving the healthiest plants, the healthiest sort of thing to offer. And we already do that. I, I guess I just don't understand why we can't. 
It's a, but in your mind, you would only be selling the starts. You would only be selling. You would not be selling like t- like flour packaged, ready to go. Oh, I would love to be able to do that. Also, not what you're talking about. No, well, I know. I mean, you're talking about propagation licenses. Well. I was right. invited yeah. to sort of come here to speak to. So, if you were all out there, of course, I would like to be able to do that. Not because of that product and whatnot. I just wanted to make sure I was honing in specifically that we were speaking to the same. Yes, question. I'm trying to keep it focused. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, what I will definitely do is uh, when we have uh, Bran or, or Chair Pepper back up is talk to them a little bit about where the board is right now with what current cultivator licenses really allow, because you've introduced for me a little bit of uh, what I'm seeing as a, a need for some clarity on, can you sell season starts with a current cultivator license? And it seems like some maybe some uh, Cultivated licensees are doing that, and some are are saying, mm, "No, that's I don't think that that's really allowed." And there's some uncertainty or confusion there. I think it's a great question to ask. Okay. Great. Uh, any other questions for Jesse? Thank you so much for thank you. Your thank you. Us. Next up, I have uh, Maggie Lenz, who I think is here on behalf of a client who's a cultivator. Maggie, welcome to House of Ops Military Affairs. I think this might be your first time in this year. Yep, I think so. It's nice to see everyone. I will be there in person, but I'm running late, so I'm here on Zoom. Um, hi, Chair McCarthy, Representative Byron. Uh, for the record, Maggie Lenz, I work with Lee and I in Public Affairs, and I'm here on behalf of Satori Cannabis. Uh, Satori Cannabis is a company that is located in Middlebury. Um, they recently uh, remediated and fitted a 116,000 square foot building. It used to be the old Connors home building. Um, so they have uh, their tier five cultivation license, they have their tier three manufacturing license and they have their wholesale license. Um, and the reason I am here is because while we support the idea of a propagation license and completely agree with the witness that came right before me that it is a gray area right now and it's confusing. Um, we would like the size of the propagation license to be increased to 3,500 minimum, uh, or you know, we could allow the Cannabis Control Board to, um, to set that amount at a later time. But uh, right now, you know, the canopy is made up of the mother, which is breeding stock, and it generates no revenue. Um, since Vermont is filled with many small growers, Satori is projecting that they will sell um, starts and clones to 50 small growers, and then they're hoping to increase that to 100. And they have, you know, because of the because of the makeup of Vermont and all the small growers, they have to keep uh, quite a lot of variety and genetics on hand. And that is going to be about 2,500 square feet for mothers, and they're estimating about a thousand for clones. Um, so yeah, the nursery licenses, they generate less revenue per square foot um, than flower cultivators, obviously. And like I said, they need to keep a really large area of canopy um, that has a bunch of genetic stock in it uh, that's in vegetative state. So the clones are cut from this mom stock and then the canopy area of the mother um, does not generate revenue. So um, it's something that we see as an agricultural commodity. And therefore we would ask that you take the 2,500 and increase it to at least 3,500. And that's pretty much it. Could you help me understand the the, the sort of the reason why that, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the, the, so is it just that the idea of being able to, to have more, to just do more volume, is that the logic behind that? Yeah, I mean, it's because they're going to need so many, they're going, they're hoping to work with a lot of small growers, right? So there's so there's going to be a, just so many different kinds of variety and having uh, 2,500, they've run the numbers, it's just not enough canopy for their purposes to create enough genetics and variety for um, the demand in the state. Any other questions for Maggie? That was a pretty clear ask. Yeah. We'll ask for some feedback from other folks on that. Um, so thank you for being with us. Um, committee, I, I want to um, say, so I believe that Eric is, is on Zoom. Um, and I had scheduled a 15 minute break now, but I think it might make more sense to get Eric's testimony in the perspective of a caregiver, then take a break and come back, if that's okay with the committee going for one more. 
Um, so Eric, if you're ready, uh, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind testifying a little earlier. We're, we're running pretty efficiently this morning. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, thank you for having me. Um, so my name's Eric St. Croix. I was a caregiver to a child who had cancer. And this bill on the side of medical seems to address just about every challenge we had, um, which was plant counts for one, and um, only one caregiver, only one patient. Um, the initial issue with that was already remediated in older um, bills because we weren't allowed to go to the dispensary and grow. So that was a challenge. We had to get a bunch of our medicine from friends like Jesse and people like that, not Jesse in particular, but kind of a community of that. And that was already taken care of in old bills, but there were parents having custody issues at the time and you were only allowed one extra caregiver and the primary caregiver. So two, where the parents were in a situation that they couldn't grow and both administer medicine. So they had to lose their caregiver. And this directly addresses that with the, the ability to add more caregivers. Um, also the list of qualifications, um, that's a different story that doesn't really lead into our scenario particularly, but uh, consideration in this bill is that if a doctor is able to prescribe a medicine to somebody, shouldn't that more be the determination that um, not so much the, the qualification, but the fact that a doctor determines that either there's anxiety that needs Xanax, so cannabis could be a better alternative to that. There is a situation where the doctor thinks acute pain needs to be medicated through, say, opioids and Cannabis would be a potentially better alternative to that. So not, not so much basing it on qualifications, but more so whether or not a doctor is already willing to prescribe the medicine. Um, let's see. Plant counts was a pretty big detriment because with two plant counts, uh, two plants for the amount you have to grow for cancer, uh, the kind of agreed upon protocols are a pound a month. And with two plants, you're going to maybe have a pound in about three to four months with cancer that could be kind of too long. Um, so the plant counts would more allow not to have more big plants, but to not grow your plants so big and have a short grow. Um, one of the nice parts of that is you need less intense lighting for that because you're not trying to light four feet deep. You're Eric, I just wanted to say, uh, it seems like every once in a while your voice is kind of fading out. I don't know if you can yeah. step a little closer to your microphone um, yes. or, or your phone so we can hear you a little better. Okay. Is that better? Yes, that sounds very clear. Thanks. Okay. So going from that to um, what's happening with the dispensaries, if we're losing dispensaries, if they're having a hard time keeping up, um, that's opening up more room for the need for caregivers, there's a benefit to the patient in that, in the price per pound and growing compared to purchasing. When you grow cannabis small scale, the average price to grow it is $300 a pound. That's $18.75 an ounce. At a dispensary, you're paying three to 400 an ounce. So on that, plant count, getting your pounds quicker, getting it cheaper, there's a huge benefit in, in being able to do that with more plants with um, not going to a dispensary. So the more of us there are to be able to do that, the more it's gonna help the people who are sick to get medicine. Um, trying to read from a few things here. Um, I don't think the caregiver issues right now are really uh, have the the fears that that we think they could because all of the states around us have uh looser regulations on their caregiver systems and even on some of their recreational growth so to come to vermont which is kind of known as being a, a little bit of a struggle of a state 
to do something devious with that, I, I don't really see happening. And you guys pretty much hash this out every year. So if there is some kind of, hey, we need to tighten that back up, it's not so far out that there's been a big detriment because of it. So it'd be nice to consider that on these things too. Um, like the people before me said, most caregivers are, are helping a family member, saving money, growing them a, a alternative and not having a side hustle kind of business out of this thing. Um, Let's see. I think that pretty much speaks to most of it. One person had mentioned that um, having a different scenario for people who move into the state. I have a friend who's from Pennsylvania and moved into the state because of our medical system, because her daughter was on the Pennsylvania medical system, was going to college and they picked Vermont due to its ability for her to get into the medical system easy enough moved here just for her college. And that would have been quite a challenge if she was treated differently than somebody who's in Vermont at the time. Um, so I think that's more the kind of people that we're seeing um, having to get into the system and, and, and navigate it more so than somebody who's coming here to, to set up some sort of devious scam. Um, I think, for the most part, that takes care of my experience. We had a hard time because of plant counts. Um, having more would have allowed us to grow it quicker. And like Jesse Lynn said, if there's an issue with a plant, which we never had issues, but but you have the ability to get rid of that and compensate rather than just start over. Um, let's see. Eric, could I maybe ask you, um, you know, most of the committee is is new. We've had a lot of turnover in the house um, mm -hmm. this year, and some of us have been working on Canvas policy for a, a couple or a few years. Some of us, this is really new. Mm -hmm. um, you said at the beginning that you were the caregiver for a child, and I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to kind of contextualize just a little bit of maybe just tell us a little bit more about your story and sort of how how you came to have the perspective of the inconvenience of the plant counts and, and, and that if you yes. don't in a little bit more context for us, so we can kind of understand like who is a yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> and I've, like you say, I've done this for a few years where I, I add my little bit to what everybody else has said. And so I, I forget that part. So um, basically because of my proximity and I had had a friend from California send straight CBD products to me a couple of times for issues I had with me and my dog. So I had just after the 2014 farm bill kind of been fascinated by the hemp and CBD and had a friend send me some for a few things. My niece ends up at two and a half years old with a cancer diagnosis in the middle of the night. And we start looking into cannabis and cancer. And that was kind of our first wow, um, just going through Google and seeing what's coming up on that. So mom decided she wanted to do that uh, she was down in Randolph. I was in Stowe at the time, and the only dispensary the state would allow to deal with it was Burlington um, CBD. And so that put me right between them. Mom's dealing with all of the hospital stuff, so she couldn't really run back and forth. So that just by chance put me as her caregiver because I said, hey, I'm willing to, to do whatever you need. Um, so from there, we started getting product made from the dispensary. But as I pointed out, the price of it was was pretty through the roof and growing it was a way more viable option. But early on, you couldn't do both. So as we stopped using the dispensary, we had to find a network of people that would help us with cannabis until we got to where we had a harvest. And that that took a while with two plants. It was not easy to get to a product for her. Um, that process of being her caregiver and stuff was interrupted when when dad and the lawyer realized that he was administering cannabis illegally to a minor. Um, so they said there's only two caregiver cards allowed. Dad's got to get the second one so he can administer. And now you're back to only being able to buy from the dispensary. So that was a, a direct negative effect due to us not being able to have a third caregiver, which would have just been 
still the same one caregiver in the respect of growing it or procuring however uh, medicine for her, it would have just allowed two different people at different times to administer it. So you could have that come up with uh, in-laws who are taking care of a kid, uh, grandparents, uh, any scenario where a kid's with two different adults at any time who aren't the grower or, or medicine procurer. Um, the few times I have gone over her story, it's it's uh, nice to let everybody know that it ended well and she, this may, will be at six months with uh, clear scans on her cancer. Um, so she's nine and a half years old now, no noticeable cognitive decline at all. Um, we haven't grown anything since we stopped giving her medicine. Um, so it's not, you know, that scenario of going out and shopping for another uh, person I can be a caregiver for, or, you know, hey, this is a scenario I can make some money off of. My experience and the people I've come across in this are all truthfully in that scenario where they're very happy to help somebody and and get them savings and get the medicine. Eric, thank you for expanding and sharing a little bit about your story. So glad to hear that it uh, is going well. I hope that those scans stay clear. Um, anybody on the committee have questions for Eric? Really great to hear a caregiver perspective, and I really appreciate you taking the time and, and being with us this morning, Eric. Um, mm -hmm. I have uh, Representative Cooper. Well, I, I don't have a question. I, have a, um, uh, I, I hope, hope I don't have to see you guys next year, but uh, <laughs> if I do, it's, it's always great to feel like I'm making a little bit of a difference in there, giving you some perspective, some real perspective to go by. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. I'm Representative Cooper. So I've been told English is not my primary language, <laughs> uh, but to clarify what both uh, Jessalyn and, well, pretty much everybody seemed to say, my problem is not with the caregiver's interaction with their client and the business of administering cannabis. It is that through our process of giving them an authorization to operate under a particular state uh, blessing that we need to make sure that they are as pristine as possible. And somebody that we've had a relationship with in the state of Vermont for a long time, uh, maybe that suffices, but somebody that comes in from out of state uh, is a blank card for us. And, um, I know with my elderly aunt, uh, Eric talked about people who uh, require a lot of care. So you become dependent, you develop a relationship. Uh, my aunt has people sign her or write out her rent checks for her uh, just because, you know, the Meals on Wheels guy is there a lot, she knows him. Uh, so that potential to get off that cannabis role and into something else is mine. A flag that goes up when we talk about elderly protection. I hope that clarifies things. So I, so I, I can't think, be any worse than the black and white movie thing. <laughs> so I think what what I'd like to suggest, Representative Hooper, is that we go ahead and take the break. I promise. Um, we'll, we come back and we'll have a conversation up at eleven. If you could really huddle with me and Chair Pepper and see if we can come up with a suggestion to bring back to the committee. Uh, to try to alleviate your concerns um, because I want to make sure that we don't leave them unaddressed, but um, but I also think we, we kind of need to find a path uh, quickly if we're going to try to make some change on that particular section. So um, let's take a break. All right. Welcome back to the second installment of the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee this morning. <laughs> we are um, picking up our conversation on H270 and uh, Cannabis Control Board Chair Pepper is here with us. So, Pepper, thanks for joining us. I know uh, we both face travel, childcare, uh, the snow, snowy Vermont morning issues this morning. So, I appreciate you being here. My pleasure. For the record, James Pepper, Chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. And I, I apologize I wasn't here this morning, really. Our twin boys were upstairs running around and. <laughs> 
their child care center. There was a wire down and they caused the fire. And my wife actually had to pick them up in the woods yesterday because they wouldn't let anyone drive to the. Oh my God. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like next level. Yeah. I was complaining about shoveling. <laughs> Um, well, so I, I, you know, I've been kind of filled me in on some of the testimony that um, everyone heard. I did catch kind of the second half um, of the of the morning session. And, you know, I think she explained some of the rationale behind uh, the new drafts, the amendments um, to uh, the as introduced version. And I'm here to answer any lingering questions that the, that the committee may have. Um, I can talk about any aspect of the bill or address some of the testimony that you've heard this morning. Um, so I have a few things. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe just um, that are in response to the, the testimony we heard. So I, I want to um, quickly say that we talked about huddling before we broke um, and Representative Hooper um, had brought up some concern about um, going to the in-state background check systems. And um, it sounded like there's some openness that if we um, can work with Ledge Council, maybe come back this afternoon um, with uh, looking at if somebody can't demonstrate uh, at least a year of residency, that they would kind of de default to the federal background check uh, and fingerprinting. Um, and if that would be okay with the CCP. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, we have, 223 caregivers currently um, as of today, and they're currently subject to this fingerprint supported background check. Um, and, you know, we're trying to make it easier for, for them um, because again, the vast, vast majority of these people are, you know, children that are growing for their parents um, or picking up from um, a medical dispensary. Um, you know, there's one, there's one location in the state that allows the kid Finger, electronic fingerprint supported background checks that have a very quick turnaround. Everyone else has to kind of go through a little bit more onerous of a process. Um, just again, given the kind of authorization that they actually have, it seems a little bit unnecessary. We want we want these caregivers to be able to provide for these ailing people, but but it's a very legitimate concern that we we also are kind of granting them a license to operate in a way. And you know, almost all regulated professions have some kind of background check procedure. So I think this is a nice balance um, to kind of people that we don't know, people that haven't a long history in Vermont, maybe we do the 50 state, people that have a long history in Vermont, um, you know, we do the Vermont background check and check the two registries. <clears throat> Representative Hooper, of course. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Pepper for that consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any, so we'll, we'll pick that back up when we have some language to look at, but any lingering questions about the, the caregiver background check changes? Okay, we'll circle back to that once we have a little bit of new language. Um, the next thing I had on my list from this morning um, was the um, question about the, with a propagation cultivator license, um, it sounded like the 2,500 square feet was the uh, the number that was uh, proposed by the Cannabis Control Board. Heard a rep from you know a pretty large uh, licensee currently that they'd like to have additional canopy. Is there a specific sort of reason for 2,500, or is it the desire to just not have kind of infinite clones <laughs> be able to be? Yes, I mean, a 2,500 square feet, um, by way of context, would be a tier two cultivator uh, in Vermont. Um, you know, we had, most states have an uncapped nursery license. Um, you know, the, the thought is, is if you are, if you specialize in clones, you know, we want a clean, clean source material for this industry. And if someone's going to specialize in this aspect of it, why cap them, you know, but, uh, you know, and so we actually proposed last year a nursery license, propagation license, they're synonyms. Um, and uh, it did not have a cap. And there was some concern that, you know, we might see a massive, massive uh, operation that just specializes in this. And, um, you know, I think that the board heard that concern and, and now coming back saying 2,500, is that the right number? I mean, you know, Essentially, these people are going to be 
supplying the entire industry. Um, and so 2,500 means that there's going to have to be many of them uh, to get to kind of supply the entire industry. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really just a policy decision. There, there wasn't much of a rationale behind the cannabis boards 2,500. Um, we didn't, we, we heard the concern from the legislature and didn't want to make it unlimited or uncapped. Um, so I appreciate your willingness to kind of jump all over the place based on things we heard this morning. <laughs> um, so there's flexibility uh, for the number of caregivers right now or discretion that we're putting in the bill for um, the number of caregivers for a patient who is 18 years or younger, as I read it, right? Um, is there any reason not to, to give the Cannabis Control Board that discretion for other patients? There, so, I mean, I think you heard probably uh, from Jesse Lynn today, um, you know, because she, she certainly has um, kind of articulated uh, her concerns with the board that, you know, some people need around the clock coverage 24-7. Um, and to limit the number of caregivers, uh, you know, without any sort of discretion um, for the board or someone's particular circumstances, you know, has led to just people having to operate illicitly, um, people having to kind of break the law around caregiving. Um, and it's, you know, I think you heard it even from Eric St. Croix, he, you know, because both mother and father were divorced, were separated, living in different parts of the state, both needed to administer the medicine, and neither of them knew how to cultivate. And so they had to engage with a third party. He was operating illegally. Um, and, you know, it's a position that people don't like to be in, but they're going to do what's necessary. Um, you know, I would like that discretion, but again, uh, you know, I can't can't speak to future cannabis boards. I'm not going to be at this in this job forever. Um, you know, I would like to be able to, you know, listen to a person's circumstances and determine what the appropriate number of caregivers are. But it's a trust exercise between the cannabis board and the legislature. Historically, it's always been one to one, one patient, one caregiver. You know, because of this story, actually, they changed it for people under 18 um, to two, um, and uh, you know. Even in that situation, it wasn't enough. So uh, my next question comes out of Mr. Lucas's testimony, which has to do with this ambiguity around um, current folks who have a cultivation license. Mm -hmm. Is it the board's position that they're allowed to um, sell seeds and starts uh, sort of currently off there, like, but my understanding is they can only sell to other licensees, but it sounded like there's some sort of ambiguity or, or question about that. So I was wondering if you heard those comments and could maybe respond or clear that up. I, I walked in halfway through. Um, we have the position that um, cultivators can sell um, to other licensees, not to the general public. This has been complicated um, by the DEA, um, you know, they. There's a law firm that really pushed the DEA on whether seeds, um, specifically seeds, um, should be considered for the purposes of the Controlled Substance Act. Um, and they, there's a DEA determination letter, it's called, that says seeds are hemp. So they're not a schedule one. <laughs> Tomato seed and a cannabis seed shall be treated equally in the eyes of the law. Um, and so we can't really stop a cultivator from selling a seed. Um, you know, when it comes to clones, I do not believe that there's the same determination from, although the same law firm and others advocates are trying to get the DEA to kind of make a ruling on clones. Um, but, uh, you know, we, so what we've said is, you know, clones can be sold within the supply chain, but they have to, they can only be sold to the general public through retailers. Um, if they were to be sold by cultivators, I just would caution that um, we have about 250 cultivators in the state. Um, this would be people coming onto the cultivation farms to purchase them or coming to a farm stand to purchase them. You know, we have very strict 
controls over our retail licensees, including point of sale systems, inventory tracking, age verification, um, advertising, and um, it could potentially create a resource issue at the board if all of a sudden we had 250 retail locations for clones. Um, so it's just a concern that the board has with kind of opening the door at this point to what would essentially be kind of farm gate sales. Um, yeah, I, I have heard a significant, um, you know, we heard testimony from the <laughs> Association, Mr. Lucas today, a real desire for there to be able to be sale from licensed cultivators to the uh, on farm. Um, I, I think that that is a question that deserves some more discussion. I don't think we're going to be able to resolve it in the context of the bill, because I know uh, there are significant <laughs> there's significant concerns you bring up um, just some of them, but uh, this question of you know what we how we define cannabis, especially uh, either before or if, or if it's ever, if the plant's ever going to have enough THC to be intoxicating in any way, is a is a question that I think we're going to continue to wrestle with as we deal with these policies over the years. Um, but I think we're not going to address that in each 270. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the idea that we've been um, just trying to put some structure to is, is maybe having a limited set of over 21 farmers markets, you know, a limited, maybe a pilot program where we would allow just a, a farmer's market that could take place in a place that's not visible to the general public could have direct, uh, could have a number of stands of cultivators that would allow this kind of direct to market access, which the cultivators desperately need, um, you know, if they're going to be successful. Um, it just, it, to allow people onto the farm at this point um, is, is would just I think require more staffing from at the board level just to make sure that the same some of the same protections that we have on the retail stores could apply here. And again, this is a very high value crop at a specific time of year. It's also a largely cash industry, um, and so um, you know trying to balance all of these public safety and consumer safety. It's challenging and it just takes, you know, just takes some, some thoughtfulness and some resources behind it to make sure it's working well. All right, I've dominated the chair's time here. Uh, other other questions for Chair Pepper? Is this um, anything in the bill? Yeah, we're, 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 there? we're wide open. Pepper is, is uh, you know, I think he's he's pretty familiar with everything that's in the bill, so I'm willing to let it be a little free ranging if you want to go first. Yeah, sure. Again, I apologize for being late this morning. So. Um, the question I've got, and I've, I've received a number of emails from doctors as well as just, I guess, individuals that are following this bill. And one of the concerns that they have, a, a big concern, is that the additional qualifying medical conditions. And I'm just curious as to where, where these all originated from and whether there's any actual background uh, of, of harm that could be uh, attributed to adding these. Who, who initially um, crafted these, these additional um, qualifying conditions? Uh, so the, the, the ones that are in current law, I think there's, a, there's some board, I think, that creates them. I think the medical society could explain that a little bit better. Um, but, you know, I sit on this Cannabis Regulator, Regulators Association. We don't take any industry money. It is literally just people around the country that are, you know, on cannabis boards and they're supporting staff that are kind of talking about emerging issues. Um, and um, I sit on the medical marijuana or medical cannabis um, subcommittee. Um, you know, I, I have real concerns that the medical program is kind of heading in a in a direction that might not be sustainable. Um, and so um, the chair of that committee is the um, chair of the medical cannabis board for uh, Minnesota. And I just asked, how do you go about adding qualifying conditions to your program? Because some, some people have anxiety, some people have 
if you're going to prescribe, I think Pennsylvania, a number of states have, if you're going to prescribe an opiate, then you can also prescribe a medical card um, or you automatically get access to a medical card. Some people have acute pain. Some people have whatever a doctor thinks is appropriate. You know, there's, you know, there's a, a wide array of qualifying conditions out there. Um, and um, so, so Minnesota, they have a petition-based process. They, I should say their medical program is housed within the Department of Health. Um, they have a petition-based process. So when a, you know, once a condition um, like multiple sclerosis or something like that gets 500 signatures, some, some number of signatures, then it triggers a review by a medical, a medical research team at the Department of Health. And they put together, they look at all of the kind of preclinical studies, the clinical studies, the observational studies that have been conducted in the United States, and those are usually pretty limited, but also internationally. And they kind of break down the components of what the kind of symptoms of the condition are. And they look for, has cannabis um, been effective treatment for any of those conditions? And then they make a recommendation back to the Medical Cannabis Board and the Commissioner of Health. And then they vote on whether or not they should include it. And they've denied things like anxiety in the past. They've denied um, a lot of conditions. Um, but these are the, but the conditions that I'm, I was requesting in this bill would square our list with Minnesota. I mean, I don't presume that we should, I don't think we have the resources to kind of do what Minnesota does. Um, certainly not kind of at our Department of Health. Um, but I thought that we could just piggyback off of what they've done. And I've submitted all of the um, white papers that they've produced, Minnesota has produced for all these conditions. They were under my name um, the last time I testified, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, that being said, you know, the, the, the research is limited. You know, it, it is very limited. And um, I know that the Department of Health got these white papers yesterday and they didn't have a chance to review them in time for the hearing that we had in uh, human services yesterday. So. Okay, thanks for that. Senator? Yeah, Parker, you just mentioned something that I didn't know existed, the National Cannabis Control Board. Yeah, regular like the AAA. Um, still federally frowned upon is anybody reporting that the feds have stuck their nose in a little bit and said, hey, what are you doing? Or you're pushing this too far. And if they did, where would they come? Um, well, it's very complicated history um, with the fed or federal government. Um, uh, I could I could review some of my notes from That's okay. no, um, we can talk. I'd say the I'd say, the, the you know, the the Cole Memoranda, which kind of blessed states moving to legalize adult use cannabis, um, was uh, drafted and released, and it's just guidance. It's not pol it's just policy. It can be overturned, and it has been overturned. It was released in 2013, and that kind of allowed um, states to proceed with adult use medical. Colorado was the first, and uh, you know, Washington, Oregon followed very closely behind Alaska as well. Um, when Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded that memo in 2018. And um, so, you know, everyone kind of didn't know what to do. You know, are, the, are these kind of DEA, DEA raids going to resume? Um, um, that didn't happen. You know, it was, you know, this is a, it was a $30 billion industry. Like, it's kind of hard to put the brakes on it uh, just overnight. Um, and, um, and, you know, there's been some movement federally last year. President Biden signed the first standalone cannabis piece of legislation that passed. It was a pretty narrow in its scope. It was allowed for greater access to research licenses for federally backed institutions to possess and research cannabis. Um, you know, President Biden um, pardoned simple possession for people with uh, federal charges. Um, it, there's talk of this in this regulators association that there's going to be a new coal memoranda um, coming out um, soon because it sounds to me like safe banking probably isn't going to pass this year. Um, and so they, we need a kind of new baseline that gives credit unions, especially the, um, this, what they need, the kind of roadmap to banking cannabis funds if safe banking isn't going to pass. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions for Chair Pepper at this point? So um, I have a I have had a request uh, for us to um, have uh, the Vermont Medical Society's representative had, has asked me to invite a doctor from Colorado in to testify. So I'm wondering um, maybe if Chair Pepper, you'd be willing to stick around while we hear Dr. I think it's Dr. Stout's testimony um, regarding H270. Um, then we'll kind of pick this back up before we break for lunch um, a few minutes early, because I know a number of us are attending the early childhood day lunch. And the, um, my plan would be, assuming that four is not super long, for us to come back and uh, hopefully look at a draft that incorporates some of the feedback that we've heard this morning, um, try to address Representative Hooper's um, idea about the caregiver residency uh, kind of having a, an, another pathway there and then um, a couple of the other more minor changes I think so um, sure Pepper, just cool. hang tight sure. that would be great and um, I'll invite Dr. Stout to join us on zoom here welcome to the House Committee on Gov Ops and Military Affairs uh, good morning um, thank you very much I really appreciate being allowed to I give some testimony. Uh, I I am Libby Stout. I am a board certified. I'm sorry, my internet is not the best, so I might have to stop my video. But um, I am a board certified addiction psychiatrist in Colorado, and I have been. Um, I have given talks, and I have testified in Vermont before, uh, mainly on several occasions just to help people understand the significant consequences we've seen in Colorado from our fairly unregulated market. And I, uh, looking at your H-270 bill, I have some very serious concerns that some of the things in that bill are going to significantly increase your public health harms. And I, I just think it's really important to recognize that. Uh, first of all, I would speak to the issue about the post-traumatic stress disorder situation. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a very treatable illness or disorder, extremely treatable. Um, there has not been a single study that is a well-designed, well-represented, demonstrating that cannabis helps PTSD or resolves PTSD or treats PTSD. In fact, most of the studies have shown definitively that it makes people worse. Uh, there was a brand new um, study just recently published on data from the National Health and Resilience uh, Study in Veterans um, between 2019 and 2020 and looking at over 4,000 veterans. And they found basically that frequent cannabis use actually worsens PTSD symptoms. Um, other studies have shown that yes, it definitely makes people worse. Uh, some studies have shown that yes, temporarily it works in the fact that yes, it numbs people and it, you know, it can take away the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, when it's used acutely, but that requires somebody to use it regularly on a regular basis, like daily, sometimes multiple times a day, then that sets them up for um, cannabis use disorder, psychotic symptoms, um, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And so this is why this has not been really beneficial. There actually was this review article that looked at all of the peer reviewed studies and randomized controlled trials in humans from 1974 to 2020. And they found that while low dose of THC and their low dose was 7.5 milligrams, that could um, potentiate fear memory extinction and so it then could decrease anxiety in people with PTSD without any psychotic effects. However, they found that when they got into stuff that was greater than 10% or greater than 10 milligrams, that that did not facilitate fear memory extinction and it increased anxiety and increased psychotic symptoms. So that, that then speaks to your idea about expanding the amount of, of 
of THC available in a package. And that, I mean, I have been so happy with Vermont to date because they're the, like the first state to actually put some stricter regulations on these things and have a potency cap. And so, I, Dr. Think Stout, I just want to be really clear, and I've been doing this in all of our previous testimony. When anyone talks about potency, I just want to be very clear for the committee because it's easy because that's being discussed elsewhere in the building to get confused. And we have a lot of new folks to this on our committee. There is no change in H270 about potency limits or serving size limits. The one change we're talking about that you did reference, um, that, and I appreciate your caution and concern on, is the amount of servings we're allowing or the total uh, amount of um, THC that we're allowing in a container, uh, potentially going from 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams. But I, I just want to be super clear for the committee um, just that they understand your testimony that we're not, we're not talking about changing the potency of any of those uh, approved products today. Okay, okay, and I appreciate that. I understand that. So mm -hmm. basically it's expanding the amount that's available in a package. And that is concerning in the fact that um, the more somebody uses, the more problematic it's going to be. And we've had these significant increases nationwide in young children getting hold of these things. Um, even in places like Canada where they have really good packaging, you know, and it's it's supposed to be not available to the kids, they've have they've had like an eight hundred percent increase in kids in the in the emergency room having to be admitted to hospitals. And so the less amount that's in a package, the better uh, in these regards. There's also studies now showing that there's this in almost a 2000% increase in older people ending up in emergency rooms or hospitalizations because of the high doses of THC that people are using. And, and, and I, there, I just saw a webinar on somebody who is a cannabis researcher and treats people with cannabis. And she was even saying that what they need is the low dose THC, not these high dose products. And, and so a biggest you know, concern I would have for your population is you already have this huge use of um, THC by those 18 to 24 where their brains are still developing and they have this this really significant impact that i don't think they're aware of because you know the 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 publicity has been oh this is great this is safe this is good for you there's nothing wrong with it and so kids are using it and so um that would be my biggest concern yeah dr stout i'm just uh, you're bringing up some some data that I, you know, we've we've seen data that we're all familiar with with the youth first behavior survey. Um, yeah, and so and so I'm I'm just trying to understand a couple of the the different points that you're bringing up about um, the the high use and also you know my understanding and, and we've had significant um, pressure on us and the cannabis control board to loosen our advertising laws. And we've been reluctant to do that because we don't want, and we've taken great strides to keep this and packaging standards to keep our, our cannabis market um, not, you know, being uh, marketed to minors. So I'm just wondering, maybe just in our Vermont-based context, I know you're you're speaking with the, the Colorado perspective, but if um, but if you're talking about Vermont-specific youth youth use data. And, and if I may yeah. real quick, as you're referencing studies and speakers, <clears throat> instead of saying like a study, a person, could you please actually like share the information with us? I have no data to look at to see who compiled it, analyzed it, or funded the studies. Please. Right. Well, and actually, I know that you heard really good testimony yesterday from the Vermont um, Medical Society people. That and they're the ones. So they're basically saying that Vermont has the highest rate, one of the highest rates, and that 41% of 18 to 25 year olds have used cannabis in the past 30 days. That's in Vermont. That's, I think, highly significant. That's almost half of the kids of that age group. Um, and, and so I think that that's very significant information. 
And yeah, I could give you the um, the references for the the uh, PTSD studies I've given. I, I could send that in an email. I'd be happy to do that. And, and maybe the YouTube speaker you were citing as well. Pardon? You're, you cited a, a presentation you saw on YouTube or online, if we could see that as well. It, any of the points that you referenced in your testimony as applicable to this? Okay. As part of your information gathering, I would love it if you could share that with us. Okay. Um, I actually have a little brief little slideshow just on post-traumatic stress disorder, and that has the references in the slide, so I could send that to you. That would be wonderful. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions for Dr. Sarr from the committee? Well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we, uh, I think you, we, we have a variety of perspectives about uh, specifically this container size question um, that, that you bring up. And of course, concerns about um, making sure that we're not marketing to minors. Are there other questions for Dr. Stout? Anything else we wanna present quickly? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for testifying today. Just curious, you, you say you're in Colorado. What are you seeing? Of course, you've been at it 10 years now. Uh, what are you seeing as uh, the, the number of people that may be reaching out to you or others for, for help in, in that, that regard, usage of, of cannabis? Well, I'd, I'd have to say that the biggest problem has been with cannabis-induced psychosis. We are seeing significant increases in that, and it is totally related to the increased amount of THC that people are using and the frequency of their use. Um, you know, so we, ha we have young people that are smoking dabs, you know, the, the very high concentration stuff or vaping stuff that's like 60%, 70% um, that is really creating havoc with their mental health. And so I think that's the biggest thing that we have been seeing. And so that makes it the most concerning. And that's why we were successful in getting our bill passed back in 21, uh, which limited the availability of medical marijuana for 18 to 20 year olds. Um, back before that bill, we had 18 to 20 year olds that could get 40 40 grams of concentrate um, daily, which is insane. Right now they could they can get two grams of concentrate, but that's still a, a, an amazing amount of THC. Because if you look at the research for medicinal cannabis, like, like we have these drugs, like we have Marinol, we have, um, well, it's Dronabinol, Marinol. And the FDA, and that's pure THC, so it's 100% THC, but the recommendation is that people not take more than 10 milligrams twice a day. If you look at what an 18 to 20 year old can get in Colorado, if, if they buy a bag of shatter, which is 80% THC, then there's 800 milligrams in that one gram bag. And then they can buy two of them. So that's 1,600 milligrams of THC that they can buy and use. And, and then they're thinking that it's medicine. And it is not medicine. I mean, that is not medicine. And so most of the people that are advocating the use of that I believe are doing the right thing in terms of using medicinal cannabis are talking about using concentrations well below 10 milligrams. And, and not using these huge amounts. And so if you have a package of 50 milligrams, then there's five doses in there. But if you expand that to 100, then there's 10 doses in there. And so that just expands the risk yeah. for these things. Representative Byron. So you keep referencing 18 to 21 year olds in Colorado. What is the legal age to purchase cannabis products retail in Colorado? Retail is 21. Okay, so but, it sounds like if there's a consumption issue with that youth demographic, you have a compliance issue, not necessarily a product issue. 
Yeah, except that their brains are still developing until they're 25. So, I mean, it's still it's still a public health problem. So, um, but but you keep referencing an age range where they're actually not even legally allowed. It. And we're speaking to a controlled environment, not an uncontrolled environment within this committee's conversation. <laughs> OK, but this is also I mean, they can do it if they've got a medical card and it's very easy to get a medical card. I don't know how easy it is in, in Vermont. We're one of the strictest states. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we've limited our, our, our potency caps and also have a, a stricter regime, which, um, so we're, we're balancing, we're balancing uh, the desire to have actually our uh, medical program be more open, um, like some of the concerns that you brought up, but Representative Bigley, you had a question. No, again, I'd just like to say, regardless of whether or not those, uh, uh, limits are in this uh, bill H270. Uh, I know the Senate has uh, considered and uh, is, is, I don't know if they've taken testimony or not, it's kind of dropped off the radar a little bit, but uh, looking at uh, um, um, increasing that THC cap from 60% uh, further, basically talking about how there's still a concern that the illicit they're going to get it through the illicit market anyway and of course we want to we want to have it be a a, a good protected product uh, you know to even go further and, and i've received <clears throat> information from uh lamoille county valley uh health uh folks that were just in new york state uh, you can have all the regulations you want um but whether or not uh it's followed whether it's in colorado new york uh, there's, there's stipulations where they were just down in New York here, uh, where it's, it's on the streets. It was, it was being sold to them on Times Square, solicited for sale on Times Square. Um, you know, these are all things that are, that are against the law down there. And it's basically, they're saying too, that uh, law enforcement isn't even going to attempt to enforce some of the uh, regulations. And, you know, they even talked here about uh, talking with law enforcement in regards to uh, a lot of the regulations and so on, and, and saying that uh, um, the only thing that they're really able to to enforce is underage use. So there is a there is a concern, at least in my point and, and from what I've heard from other states. So, but again, I appreciate you even talking about the effects of uh, increased dosages of THC. Representative Nugent. Um, is it fair to say, and I'm, I'm, this might not be the perfect question for you, so um, feel free to let me know, but that part of the issue, at least with the package size, is kind of like the Overton window. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but like what becomes possible um, like along a spectrum. It's like if you have, um, I don't know, like drinking a gallon of water sounds extreme right now, but if someone has like a half gallon of water on their um, table every day, then that might make the gallon of water seem less extreme, but it still might have, in that case, actually might not be a great thing for you. <laughs> um, is that kind of like what you're saying about like package size? It's kind of like, it's a psychological thing in terms of like what's okay um, versus... I Exactly. I think that's a very good point. That's why I was kind of thrilled that you had the limit at 50, where we don't have that limit in Colorado. But now you're trying to expand it to what we have in Colorado. Um, and yes, I think it does make people think, well, that and this is true for all addictive drugs. You know, everybody starts by thinking, well, if a little is good, a lot must be better. And And so, you know, especially when it's it's couched as medicine, people are going to say, well, then 100 must be fine. You know, 50 is good, but 100 is better. Well, Dr. Stout, thank you for being with us today. Um, we're going to pick this conversation uh, back up this afternoon. Um, and I want to have a chance to um, confer with legislative council a little bit about some of the um, changes that I think we're going to ask to see when we return from the floor. Um, are there any kind of final questions for Dr. Stout from the committee? Yeah. Representative Morgan. Um, Dr. Stout, you just said addictive. How, 
is this stuff in general. It's not my world. I don't know it at all, really. So I speak from a lot of uh, level of not knowing, but is this an addictive thing that can get worse and worse and worse and snowball? I'm hearing that from you. And again, it's not my world, so I'm asking out of ignorance. I mean, because that's concerning to me as I'm hearing that from you as I, we have yes, enough this, problems with things in general in this, in this country, in this world that, you know, are we adding to it? I don't know. I, I'm just asking that as a general question. Yes, this is turning out to be one of the most addictive drugs we have. Um, my entire career, I have spent dealing with tobacco and I try and convince programs to be tobacco free because nicotine is the most addictive drug we have. However, I am now seeing that these higher potency products so are Dr. just- Staff, Can I just really, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, what, what's tricky for me about what I'm hearing from you say is you're, you, you immediately went to talking about high potency products and we have, we have limits on the potency of our products here. And so when Representative Morgan asked you about, you know, is cannabis addictive? When you talk about high potency products, I think maybe you're, you're conflating two kind of separate concerns. That's all. I, uh, I just uh, want to make sure the committee is clear about what you're testifying on. Okay. Go no, ahead, it, the, the drug itself is addicting. Yes, very addicting. And mm -hmm. when people use more of it, then they tend to develop cannabis use disorder. So if they were just using a 10 milligram piece once in a while, they're not going to have an addiction problem. But if they're using it every day, all day long, 10 milligrams, so they're using, so you have a 100 milligram package and they're using 10 doses every day they are going to develop cannabis use disorder, yes. And then that will create the problems that we're seeing with people using frequently, using regularly um, these doses. This is, you know, and that's where you start getting into the psychotic symptoms, the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome symptoms, um, because they're using regularly. And then they think, and this has been well studied also in medical marijuana patients, that when they stop using, they have significant withdrawal. And, and that's how you know it's an addictive substance, because when you use it daily, regularly, and you stop, similar to any other addictive drug, you have withdrawal symptoms. And so many people equate that with, oh, it's my symptoms are coming back. They don't realize that it's really the withdrawal symptoms. So withdrawal to marijuana is irritability, anxiety, um, anger, uh, massive cravings for um, cannabis, um, and problems sleeping, problems eating, because these are all things that the cannabis did for them. But then now they're in withdrawal. So that's why we're seeing more and more people with increased anxiety issues because of their marijuana use. Yes, it initially works. That's just like any other addictive drug. But then once you become dependent on it, and yes, there is a physiological dependence, it's not just psychological, um, then you're in withdrawal, and then you have to manage that withdrawal, and the normal way is to use again. Representative Pango, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so you were talking about the difference between high potency and low potency, and I apologize for having to be out of the room. Is there a definition of high and low in terms of milligrams of THC? Well, yes. I mean, there, there are more and more people trying to, to equate this. So the FDA came out, well, not the FDA, some people working with that came out with like a recommended dose would be five milligrams, like that's a single dose. Um, some places say maybe 10 milligrams. But then again, like I'm saying, if you use that just occasionally, like you're using ibuprofen for a headache and you just use it occasionally, that is not going to be a problem. But even with drugs like ibuprofen, if somebody uses it all day long every day and they quit, they have 
well, they start having rebound headaches just because of the drug use. Um, and so your body becomes habituated to it. And so the, um, it, it can be, you know, high potency is used to determine, you know, how much is in the product, you know, percentage wise. But there is still this milligram thing that you have to look at. And, and that's why I keep equating it back to Marinol or Dronabinol, which is the FDA says shouldn't be more than 20 milligrams a day, because when you get past 20 milligrams a day of pure THC, you start seeing the problems with the psychotic symptoms, the anxiety, the depression, those kind of things. So. Um, you know, the ideal dose, nobody really knows. But again, what I said was most people I know working with people with medical marijuana are using things like one to one balance of CBD to THC, and they may have like five milligrams of THC and an equivalent amount of CBD. And, and those people are not having problems like I'm talking about. It's when you get into using higher doses of it more regularly that you get into problems. Thank you. So I just have one comment and that is that it seems like, I mean, we're trying to, in this bill, raise the threshold, <laughs> raise the amount of milligrams in a dose um, that's for sale. No, no, that's not true. Okay, uh, so, I wanna, so, yeah, so, so let, let, me just, let me just finish, please. So I really need the healthcare committee to look at this dosage piece. So we, Human Services has traditionally looked at therapeutic use and did a, did a drive through yesterday. We might have talked about this when you were. You no, know, you said Human Services did, but I'm saying healthcare. Well, so this is a public health piece around the drug. container size. It's so that's absolutely drug. true. I, I will just say we are not going to, I, I am not putting on the table for debate the jurisdictional appropriateness of, of our committees, which committee is going to take up which bills. This bill's in our lab. I've allowed the committee who's worked on that particular piece to do a drive through and they're offering us official feedback about that later today. So I'm, I'm really trying to be as expansive and allow the biggest variety of perspectives in this conversation. I really appreciate Dr. Stout coming on short notice um, and, and providing her testimony. Before we break, I, I just wanna go back to a conversation that we had as a committee a couple weeks ago, which was that there's, we, we have in this committee um, had this question about the amount of servings that could be in a single container. And right now, a person could buy multiple 50 milligram containers. And the practical thing, the only thing that we're changing here is to say you could buy 20 gummies that only have five milligrams of THC each, we're still keeping that cap, but you could buy 20 of them in a single container if we pass that section of this bill instead of just 10. And we, you know, we looked at what the containers look like, it's a jar, the, the suggestion isn't that somebody sit down in one sitting and consume that entire jar, no more than it would be that you would drink an entire handle of vodka in one sitting, right? So that's the, the, the analogy here with other controlled substances is we allow, Vermonters to purchase much more in one package of alcohol, for instance, than we would ever suggest would be safe or reasonable for a person to consume in one sitting. And this bill only says <clears throat> that somebody could buy a single package that contains more servings in it. That's the only change that we're making in H270 around the, the, the container. So I just, I keep coming back to this because um, Dr. Stout and other folks in their testimony have brought up um, questions about potency. They've talked about things like dabs and shatter. We're not addressing any of that in H270. And I've been really trying to keep our, our discussion here as a committee focused on what's actually in the bill. Um, so, and then we've, we've got a break because okay. a bunch of us have to get across the street. <laughs> and we will come back to this discussion after. <laughs> okay, I can. I can. Is that okay? Yeah. I don't want to.
Um, great. So Dr. Seth, thanks for being with us. Um, we are going to uh, adjourn and go off live so we can all make it across the street. Uh, appreciate it. Every We're back. Thanks to legislative IT here. Uh, and thanks for everybody's patience uh, to pick up our work on H270. Um, Attorney Childs is here with the latest and greatest draft. So um, Michelle, could you walk us through draft 2 or 1.2? Sure. So for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel. And as the chair mentioned, we're working off draft 2.1. And would you like me to just show you the changes from the last draft? I didn't know if you wanted to start to go through the section by section or no, just do the changes. Yeah, let's start with the changes and then we'll discuss anything that needs to discuss and then we'll do a last job through. Sure, so if you'll turn to page nine, uh, section eight on the propagation cultivator license. So you'll see I have the highlighted language on line 15. So this is um, basically telling what someone who obtains a propagation license um, from the board can do. And this previous uh, amount was 2,500 square feet, and that's been changed to 3,500 square feet of cannabis clones, immature plants, or mature plants. Next change is on page 13. And it's also section 13. And so we're moving on to the medical cannabis registry. And this is in the definition section for qualifying medical condition. So recall the bill is introduced had a list of a number of, um, of medical conditions that would then qualify someone to be able to make application for the registry. And um, all of them have been eliminated in this draft with the exception of PTSD. And you'll note that on, you'll see the struck language on line 16 through 18. Currently PTSD is a, a recognized qualifying medical condition, but only um, if the applicant is undergoing psychotherapy or counseling with a licensed mental health provider. And so that requirement is taken out and it's just added back up to subdivision uh, 8A. And then the final change, um, this is on the caregiver section uh, with regard to the medical registry. And it's just a technical one. Um, and that is, is the, if you'll see at the bottom of page 15 in subsection C, um, there uh, it talks about um, rulemaking and uh, there was a, just a, uh, if you look at the top of page 16, um, I intended to strike just his or her and kind of reword that a little bit because as you know, we use gender neutral language as best we can, um, but I just need to restructure it and get in the words criminal history record on there because they are checking the Vermont conviction record as well as the registries. That's it. Any questions about the changes? I can give a little bit of context and then I might ask um, Chair Pepper if he wants to weigh in. We had um, looked at, uh, so we heard from, um, I think it was Satori, uh, one of the um, multiple licensees in Middlebury that they would like that cap to go from 2,500 to 3,500. I think the idea with the cap on the, the propagation, recall that this is like about the, uh, you know, immature plants as starts, right? And um, that the, when I asked Pepper about it earlier, it's one of those things of like, it's it's a little bit arbitrary. I'm just trying to find some cap because there wasn't, <laughs> especially in ways and means when this was previously came up about not just having infinite numbers of uh, starts. And so uh, I thought we would, take that recommendation the, the board's not close to that be a major change um change on the criminal history record that technical change reflects what um Bryn had brought up for us earlier so we made sure that we had struck all of i think we were trying to get rid of gendered language in that that one section in the caregiver section And I think we were able in the um, qualifying medical condition in section 13 to capture the recommendations that we got in the email from the human services committee chair. Um, 
they had some concern after their drive through with the bill about enumerating more conditions without taking further uh, testimony and doing some more research themselves. Um, but I think they considered the post-traumatic stress disorder uh, conversation previously and were comfortable with the Canvas Control Board's recommendation around striking the, the need for two signatures. And we've heard some advocacy earlier from uh, the patient perspective about asking us not to require that second signature. So, but we removed all of the other and newly enumerated conditions in this draft. So, other questions, thoughts, folks had before we walk through? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so, with the PTSD, is there still some um, requirement that that be taken or um, provided with care with a physician, or is that completely not necessary anymore? So, Attorney Childs, I think all the enumerated conditions need a sign off or, or um, note to the effect that the person on the registry has one of the qualifying conditions. Correct. And just as a little refresher is that all it is, is it's a medical verification form from your healthcare provider that you have one of those conditions. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, there's no kind of, uh, the, the healthcare provider isn't agreeing to treat you with cannabis or they're not prescribing cannabis or anything like that. They're just verifying that you meet the statutory definition and that you have that condition. Um, there's one follow oh, yeah. So they do have like, but they do have someone that they're having, that they have care from, you know, regularly or in some capacity. They have to have an established patient healthcare provider relationship with that person. Uh, so it could be a physician, could be a physician's assistant, an RN, somebody um, that's listed under there that can sign that medical verification form that knows you, that's done an examination, has a relationship with you and has diagnosed you with that qualifying condition and then they are just attesting to that and then they're submitting that um, documentation to the board. Mm -hmm. I should maybe know the answer to this, but I, I don't uh, remember, I guess, but under the propagation cultivators license, um, that's the test transport itself and <laughs> cannabis plants only to the licensed cultivators, not out of state? Right, you can't, it, everything's in state. Okay. Still federally illegal, cannot be doing business with folks outside of Vermont. It's only with other licensed uh, cannabis establishments. And then my next question is, <clears throat> if for some reason, and it could happen, I guess, that they produce more of that product, whatever it might be, than what they can sell, what, what happens to the stuff that they can't sell? I think that'd probably be a good question for Pepper in terms of what they do around compliance with their license um, and how they might address like, you know, an oversupply of a product and what and how long they can keep it, what they have to do to for, because there's um, procedures that for destroying product, things like that, and how they have to handle it. And there's a whole chain of command that they have to follow in terms of record keeping. So I think you can probably address that. Thanks. Would it make sense uh, to maybe get uh, that question and any others answer from Pepper, and then uh, we'll do a walk through, a jog through the whole bill, Michelle. That's okay. Whatever you want. Pepper, would you mind switching it up with Michelle and taking the hot seat for us? <laughs> Get your feedback on these changes. Um, for the record, James Pepper, chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk about these changes, any other changes. I know that there's probably gonna be a final walkthrough um, and I'm happy to just stick around for that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, very supportive of this bill in general. I think these changes actually do make the bill better. I mean, I know we had asked for additional qualifying conditions. You know, those that's a policy decision. If you don't want them, then, or if the other, if the legislature doesn't want them, that's fine. Um, the change to the propagation license um, is, 
you know, again, just in line with keeping things small, keeping this local, um, you know, if it was 2,500, that would have been a tier two out of five um, with respect to our other cultivator licenses. Now it's kind of in between a tier two and three, um, but it's still small. And, and by the way, just to be clear, these are micro licenses compared to our neighbors in every, every other state. You know, I don't think, you know, our small cultivator tier one doesn't even register uh, as like a craft cultivation in, in most of states. Um, so um, I'm certainly, um, certainly supportive of the change um, and the, Is there, was there anything else in, in the bill that you wanted to point me to? Um, There's that one technical change that Brandon asked us to make um, oh, that's at the top of page 60. Yes. Yeah, so I think, and honestly, I think that was just a mistake and it was caught by HA, uh, Human Services Committee. You know, essentially it said we're moving from a 50 state criminal background check to a Vermont background check. And then it authorized the board to make rules around what sort of, what sort of, condition, what sort of convictions um, should be disqualifying? What, what, what about, you know, what things from the registry should disqualify a person from being able to be a caregiver? And for some reason, that language around the criminal background check got struck as well. So essentially, we would have run a background check without any ability to kind of disqualify someone if we found a conviction that should be disqualifying. Um, and so that is just unstriking the what is current law, allowing us to use the results of the background check to um, disqualify someone. Um, you know, it's we would come up with rules around it, what sort of convictions. You know, I would assume that it would be very similar with what we do with, you know, probably our other licensees, like anything that implicates some of these coal memoranda issues around embezzlement, fraud, like felony embezzlement, felony fraud. Um, you know, maybe um, felony gun convictions or domestic violence issues, you know, certain of the list of crimes, we just, you know, we don't allow them to get any kind of license. In this so. Any other questions? any questions for Chair Pepper? Going once, going twice. Uh, I know you put a lot of work into the bill and trying to present us with some uh, suggestions for how we can kind of do some mid uh, early course corrections with the, the new retail market and, and also around some of the medical cannabis policy. Um, so I appreciate the communication and your ability to be in here uh, so much time because I, I know you all are really busy uh, as things emerge. So well, I, would, I would say the same the same to everyone here. I know you all are very busy and I know that, you know, not many people ran on a platform of fixing the cannabis market. Um, and, well, maybe some, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, this is a very rapidly evolving industry. Um, licensees in other states try and get ahead of the regulators. They try and find, you know, play in the joints of maybe uh, areas that aren't as clear. And so we just need to continuously update this market and, and, and update the statutes that underlie them so we can try our best to stay ahead of some of these issues. There's actually a lot more coming your way, I imagine, around hemp derived products and that are grown from legally, you know, federally legally grown hemp, but are psychoactive and intoxicating and are kind of exist in a gray area. Um, so um, there's more to come, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to stay if, uh, for the final walkthrough and come back um, in the chair uh, before you guys take any action. Thanks so much. So um, unless there are any other questions for Pepper from the committee, I'll uh, invite Michelle back and we'll walk through the whole thing and make sure we understand what's in, what's out. Is there anything else we need to work on before we move this bill along? Good. We're good. I just wasn't sure whether or not Pepper wanted to address um, uh, Representative Higley's oh. issue about what if uh, somebody has too many plants, how do they ad address that? Sure. And, and James Pepper, um, 
We have very strict inventory tracking requirements and people have to update their inventory anytime any change happens to their, uh, to their inventory or two weeks or, you know, whichever comes first. Um, and if, you know, with a propagation license, I think you may uh, have a fear that, you know, once, once a immature plant becomes mature, all of a sudden you're a cultivator and you're not a propagator anymore. And so we would require destruction of that if, if that were to happen and, you know, destroying cannabis plants, we have a process for that. Okay. So get out in regulation. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just go section by section and I'll just keep moving along unless you stop me. Yeah, we, we can do a jog because we've looked at right. most of this a couple of okay. times. And so I'm, if anybody on the committee wants us to stop and has a question about a piece, definitely just get your hand up. I'll try to keep scanning the room. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so page one, section one, this is the repeal of the advisory committee. Page three. Section two, this is repealing the sunset of the Cannabis Control Board member. There was in the original um, bill in 2020, there was a sunset put out um, in the future for, uh, for the board and you're repealing that sunset. Section three, um, looking at the bottom of the page is just slightly tweaking the definition of advertisement. And I think you heard from Bren Hare about why they felt as though it would be more legally defensible to have this small language tweak. Page four, bottom of the page, um, subdivision eight, just changing, making that small change, including propagation cultivators within the definition of cannabis establishment so that they would, uh, because you're adding a new licensee. Top of page five, the new definition of a cannabis propagation cultivator. Section four, um, there's a couple different changes in here. You'll see the first one being that in subdivision A3 uh, on line 11. So right now, um, packages of cannabis products cannot contain more than 50 milligrams of THC. Um, I think the chair did a great job explaining that earlier today about it's not a there are limits on how much you can buy, but this is just talking about per packaging. So this isn't the overall amount. This is just how much you can have in each package. And that's being changed from 50 milligrams of THC to 100 milligrams of THC. So this isn't in the bill, but since you brought it up, can you remind the committee what the total purchase cap is on THC? Uh, it's an ounce and there's a, there's a formula for how they, how they figure that all out if you're, if you're getting different types of so products. It's the equivalent to an ounce of flour. Right, right, because that's what you're allowed to possess under the legalization law that you pass prior to the, the establishment of the commercial system. Thank you. So uh, next change is bottom of page five in subdivision five, and this is concerning retailers. And we talked about that this morning. This was a small tweak that DOH asked for, uh, asked the CCB for around um, annual inspections for retailers. Page six, um, subdivision eight, you'll see uh, the requirements for the rules for the new propagator licenses. Bottom of page six, uh, section five starts, and this is the section that currently, you see the language that struck at the top of page seven is the language around public records, access to records. That struck in favor of the addition of the new language um, in section six on the bottom of page seven. And that continues on through page eight. One question that we did have um, come up earlier this morning on section six with the public records was um, whether this language is similar to um, public records protections for other similarly regulated industries. I wouldn't know that. Um, this is the only industry that I have any involvement in. Usually I'm all family law and occasional crimes, which is how I wound up here. <laughs> I think, I think, we, I think we will be- um, Occasional crimes. <laughs> occasional crimes. 
Um, I, I think what we'll be uh, doing later on um, as we get into some bills that deal more with the Public Records Act um, is, is looking at more of this. It strikes me that this is similar to other Public Records Act exemptions that we've seen and passed by any different um, where we're striking a balance between what does the public reasonably need to know versus sort of trade secrets and protected intellectual property and that kind of thing. So, well, we can definitely kind of return to, to this thinking Representative Nugent had that question before. Right. And as you know, Tucker is our expert, our in-house expert on this. And I have anything that's having to do with public records and things like that. I, we always, all the attorneys in our office, we always run all this stuff by him to make sure that it seems consistent and doesn't seem kind of way out there in comparison to what we have elsewhere in statute. Or at least he'll flag it for us if it is. <laughs> um, so page nine, section seven, um, this is the tweak to the cultivator licenses. So just adding in that they can be purchasing and selling um, with a propagate, propagation cultivator, and then the new addition of the language on subdivision three. <laughs> section eight is your new propagation cultivator license. Page 10, section nine is the tweak uh, to the wholesaler license um, right now that they can only be doing business with certain other licensees and this allows them to be doing business with any of the other licensees. Um, that same kind of change is made in section 10 to the product manufacturers and, it, and again in 11 with regard to the retail licenses. Page 11, bottom of the page, section 12, and this is on the fee schedule. Um, so you see it starts out talking about manufacturers at the bottom there and the uh, talking about man manufacturer tier one um, and uh, the threshold there for this license is that they would be um, producing products um, right now. It says not more than $10,000 and this ups it to not more than $50,000. Then on line seven, you have the new $500 fee for a propagation cultivator. Moving on to page 13, section 13, you have the what we just talked about, the um, changes to the qualifying medical condition. Moving on to page 14, looking at line 18, section 954 on caregivers. We just talked about that, about the little technical tweak there. You also have in this section the change so that um, a caregiver can serve uh, two, up to two patients at a time instead of just one. Um, starting on line nine for registration fees is this is a change so that if you have a qualifying medical condition of chronic pain, then you have to do the annual annual um, registration. But if you have kind of an intractable disease that is not going to be changing from year to year. So if you have MS, you don't have to necessarily go through and re redo that every year and have your doctor fill out the same form saying, yes, they still have MS. Um, next page on page 15. Um, and this is the tweak to the caregiver background checks language. So instead of, um, of doing the, the national, data, uh, national criminal history check, it's a name and date of birth, Vermont criminal conviction check, also checking the um, child protection registry as well as the vulnerable adult protection registry. Page 17, um, section 14 on the fees. Um, so this is changing the fee for dispensaries um, is that you'll see that currently there's a $20,000 uh, registration fee for the first year of operation and that's being decreased to $10,000. Section 15 um, and carries on over to page 18. Um, it's just a clarification that uh, this section doesn't apply to the retail sale of tobacco paraphernalia by a cannabis establishment. Um, so if, if a um, cannabis establishment is selling a, a pipe or a bat or something like that, that, that tax that's, um, that has been established for, um, for tobacco, for folks who have a tobacco license, then you don't have to get a tobacco license in order to sell a pipe if you're already licensed by the Cannabis Control Board to, to sell cannabis. Um, 
and cannabis products. Section 16, um, this is the establishment of the three new positions and the $850,000 appropriation um, that was also in the BAA, um, which I understand went to the governor yesterday or the day before. Um, yesterday. Yesterday. Uh, so, or to understand from the clerk's office. So, uh, my understanding, and maybe you would know this, or, or we can, I can double check with the clerk, is I wanted to keep this in here just in case something happens with the BAA. <laughs> um, so, uh, assuming that the BAA gets signed, I may, we may uh, look at a four amendment, or the Appropriations Committee is going to look at this bill, obviously, and they could. Um, suggest an amendment. So uh, I want to keep it in here for now, just in case um, something happens with BAA in between now and a few days from now and the, the deadline runs out. But um, for now, uh, I want to make sure we're belt and suspenders on this <coughs> lab, uh, appropriation. Lots more stops for this bill and yes. opportunities to take out that section. It's e easy. Um, and then final page is page 19, section 17, and this is just bumping out the date for uh, when the auditor of accounts is to report to you on the structure of the Cannabis Control Board and whether that initial structure of setting it up with three members and as an independent executive board, uh, executive branch entity still makes sense. And then the whole bill takes effect on um, July 1st of this year. You've heard a lot about this bill. <laughs> Any further questions about the bill? Questions about the words on the page? What's in it? Any of those technical pieces? Well, uh, I want to open it up for committee discussion. Michelle, you can feel free to stick around, or if you want to get out of the hot seat, I <laughs> there may be a question or two that comes out of our committee discussion, but. Uh... And water sentence. You know, I've always had something to say. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I have some questions about um, specifically removing those conditions, like we were talking about earlier, and then human services heard yesterday. Do we have to do what they say? No. Oh, that's such a great, <laughs> such question. a layered. Um, no disrespect to them yeah. and their hard work, of course. But I just am wondering, because I'm new here, how that works. And I might disagree with their recommendation, which is why I'm asking. So I obviously um, was the, the co-sponsor along with Representative Byron of the original version of this bill, mm -hmm. and personally was comfortable with taking the recommendations from the Canvas Control Board. I think there's a difference of opinion about the way that we approach the future of the medical program. And my guiding principle with this particular package, and I think we heard, heard this um, from Chair Pepper several times along the way, was that this is the package that should be the kind of like the tweaks, things that are not, you know, huge major policy changes. And so when the, the feedback that I was hearing from folks who were in the room in human services yesterday was that there was strong opposition to adding more enumerated conditions to the registry qualifications, qualifying medical conditions. And um, I want to continue to have a conversation about the health of and the future of our medical system. I want to make sure that patients have access to the types of products that they might not be able to get at the, the retail, you know, adult use market. Um, but really, there's there's a disagreement. And I think strategically for, for us and the other policy in this committee, the best thing to do right now is to say, hey, we hear you. You want to take some more testimony on these things before we make this policy change? Let's have that conversation another day. I'm kind of inclined to share your opinion that we should keep those, those in there and we should do that expansion. I don't know that now's the right time to do it. And so in asking attorney Childs to do this latest draft, I said, take the recommendation for now of the human services committee, but it's, you know, it's the committee's bill now. So I'm, I'm happy to have folks say, no, we should say thanks for your work, but we want to keep those conditions in there. 
Um, this is exactly the right time to have that conversation because we have kind of two versions of that section and we, we could go back. But I think we may hear on the floor a lot more pushback against our bill if we voted out with those conditions in it. And, and one of the, no, that was very particularly of like laying that out sort of like on how the bill will progress and whatnot. And one of the things that I heard from members who I spoke to individually from the Human Services Committee was they, they just didn't have enough time to take testimony on it. And that's why the vote looked the way it did on the recommend, or the straw poll, excuse me. Um, so I wanna be <clears throat> respectful of their desire to do a little bit more homework on it. So in my opinion, this conversation, is, it's not over. We just removed this section now so they can continue to like dig in and mine in on the subject matter that's been going through their committee as this legalization of medical cannabis has evolved over the how long, 15 years? I think it was 2004. Yeah, yeah so adopted it. Almost 20. So I, you know, I, I was not enthused with removing the language, but I also want to be respectful of our colleagues' desire to do their homework. Okay. No, I, 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 it just seems fairly arbitrary. If, <clears throat> if, it, and yes. Once again, I'm just saying that's what it seems to me, but I'm saying if we had, I guess maybe some context, and maybe Chair Pepper can offer this, or if maybe you guys would know. Um, why were those particular conditions included in the first place? And where did the, where did the information come from that, that led the creators of the bill or everybody who, who voted on it or wrote it? I guess I'm asking because if we have all this testimony or, or this information, not testimony, from Minnesota and, and those white papers and everything, if that's what led us to include those first conditions in the, that, in the first iteration of it, why wouldn't that be sufficient evidence or reason or kind of a logical next step as far as this is concerned? Based on the testimony, and my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but based on the testimony that they took yesterday, it was limited and did not provide them enough to like make an answer to say yes to this. They were cautious. Sure, but why were the first? Why were? Why was like, for instance, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are basically the same thing. I mean, not, but they're close. So why was Crohn's in that first one? It, 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 Does it, anyone know? Yeah, I actually share your well, frustration. Well, yeah. So I, Berks and Hagley may be I, able to. I asked it. that question earlier, and I think, and, and Chair Pepper can correct me, but again, there appears to be, in particular, Minnesota, that had uh, studies done on on yes. these. And that uh, rather than having our health department uh, take an extensive time and effort to go through these, that's basically where they got those particular um, Yeah, but like, so Crohn's is already included. It, it's part of it's part of the law right now. So yeah, so when you look at the but why was that included in the first place? That's the thing I don't understand. So my understanding of the history of this, Does that, well, actually, <laughs> so there's a combination of things, actually, okay. the, the way this has been put together has been iterative over the almost 20 years that, that we've had, you know, some version of the medical program in Vermont. And a lot of the pieces that are in there, my, my understanding of the history of it, some of it predates my involvement yeah. in the legislature, has been about patient advocacy. Um, some of it's been about there being, you know, some actual study or some medical professional being able to come in and say, yeah, there is evidence that this is helpful. The challenge that we have around the whole medical program and how we qualify people for it or not is that because cannabis has been a schedule one drug at the right. federal level, there's not a ton of great data. We're like we don't have federal, you know, huge population level studies of what the benefit versus risks are of the therapeutic use of cannabis. So, I mean, I, I invite Chair Pepper if he wants to weigh in on this discussion, because it is, it's really challenging for us as policymakers who are, you know, we're all citizen legislators to go, you know, which condition is in and which one's out and, and who, which doctor's opinion do we use on it? And so I, I'm sympathetic toward the testimony we heard earlier that we should base this more on, you know, symptoms and a physician saying, 
you know, this person has a condition, but I, I know that's not where some of our colleagues are both inside and outside of this room. So I'm trying to find the, the way to thread the needle. Um, so Chair Pepper, do you want to respond to that? And then I'll go to Representative Hango's question. Yeah, sure, and it's James Pepper, Chair of the Cannabis Control Board. I, I mean, I would agree with everything that was said and, and this program certainly predates my involvement with, uh, with the legislature as well. Um, and it has been, uh, evolved, it has evolved over time. I mean, I think it was very limited at first, with terminal conditions, um, and um, you, it's usually advocacy. I know PTSD. Uh, it was you know a, a number of people coming in, witnesses with PTSD. That cannabis has really helped helped me. Um, and uh, I, I think really the problem that we ran into is that, you know, I don't think I did enough of my homework with the health and human or the human services committee to, and, and you know, we have a very close working relationship with the Department of Health. And I think um, had they been able to weigh in yesterday, I think that the decision may have gone the other way, um, which, you know, if they have the time to do this, I think I'll continue to kind of push for these and, and, and have, you know, this bill has a long way to go, as Michelle said. Um, there's still plenty of time left in, the, in this legislative session um, to kind of have these conversations with the Department of Health, with the Medical Society and the other committees to um, just and, and bring in, you know, the chair of the Minnesota board to kind of just say, that, you know, just give that the other committee some assurance that they did a lot of due diligence in order to come up with their list. And, you know, I think that's what was missing. And I think that's why, you know, things didn't kind of go, they didn't support the cannabis reports recommendation. I'll just say one more thing, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Or, no. just, and, uh, that's that's also, why we're but, here. But, but, but it just, on the same thing, it just seems like, especially in light of the testimony we heard earlier from um, Jesse Lynn, was that her name? I can't remember her last name. Jesse Lynn and Amelia. Yeah, and I had asked the question because I have heard that a lot of times physicians will just, uh, or healthcare providers will just lump everything, kind of throw it into the chronic pain category because that's something that they know will get you to the, to get somebody that, that medical card that they need. But I don't think that's reflective of, of what actual needs are being met with the medical program. And I think you're making good points. Don't, and I don't want anybody on the committee to feel shy about saying, I have never. This, this is <laughs> so, you don't have to apologize for okay. asking a question or, or uh, speaking your mind. <clears throat> Representative Pango, thanks for being with Sure, and nor have I. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect handle. <laughs> Um, on the opposite end of that spectrum, this discussion that we're having here, and at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to debate what committee of jurisdiction this should be in, this whole medical conversation, in my opinion, should not be in this committee at all, because we are not the healthcare experts in this building. Um, so on that note, um, I find this bill to be very expansive of a program that we obviously have not done our due diligence for. I mean, just hearing now, oh, we, we should have had more time or we could have had more time or we needed more time with the Department of Health. Those types of comments to me <clears throat> make me feel that this is not ready for prime time. So that um, is where I'm at with this. I find it really difficult to pass something that I know very little about and that we um, need more opinions on. Thank you. Representative Morbicki and then Representative Cooper. Um, thank you. Uh, give it a little history of the medical marijuana or cannabis for symptom control, as it was called when we first did it. I was on the Human Services Committee when we passed that first bill. And uh, it wasn't Health Care Committee, it was Human Services. And as in any committee, we rely on the experts to come to us and, and we make the judgments. But some of the testimony that really convinced me that this was a good thing, for instance, we heard from a, a veteran of the, the Gulf War who was shot in the back and still had a bullet next to his spine. 
And, and the only thing he said that touched the pain was medical cannabis. He said he didn't get high on it, but it, it leveled the pain out so he could function. Um, we heard from other people uh, who, had, who were using it for um, epilepsy. Uh, and I, I don't remember what it, extensive testimony uh, to initiate this, this bill. So I just want to um, sh share that bit because I, I hear what, what you're saying about the health care committee, but I don't think that would be the committee of jurisdiction. Uh, it, it could be us, it could be human services, uh, but whoever it is, I think we, we have to make the decisions after we get our, our testimony. And we've heard, um, I think, in, enough testimony for us to move forward on this. I think it's a challenge to, for us to make those decisions no, no matter what. And uh, I, um, I'm ready to move forward with this. And uh, I, I think this, this is the place for us to be able to think. We've taken a lot of testimony here. Um, you know, I think I'm one of the people that wants to move cautiously on this, but I also think uh, we're doing our due diligence to move slowly. And uh, I think the, the Libra over here keeps balancing things out. And we've heard people say we're going too slow and others were going too fast. And I think we're falling in the middle here. So I think uh, I agree with that. We're, we're coming to, to a good place. Uh, I had Representative Hooper's question. Oh, no, so no. For, if, uh, Attorney Childs, if you had a. <laughs> no, I was just going to give you a little more context because Mike and I work together on there. But I, if I can wait, there's no question. <laughs> so, uh, Representative Hooper Burlington, you had your hand up next. <laughs> I'm going to change the subject. Child. <laughs> you wanted to go on this. Well, I was just going to say. Pepper said it best. We're going to keep updating this policy every session, so you'll get another shake. And, and I did want to, I, I did want to respond uh, to Representative Hango and just say, um, oh, yes, we we right now uh, we're 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 yeah, oh yes. Um, <laughs> I really understand that this is tricky because there are folks who would prefer that we not have the state involved in a medical or uh, an adult use retail cannabis market um, and on one side. And then we have, now that we have both of those programs markets set up, um, there are folks who are saying, open them up, do a lot more. Um, and we heard folks who were really urging us to go a lot farther and put many more things in this bill that would you know, expand access to use, that would expand the market, that would do many things that are not in this bill. And I think the fact that we heard that no one is quite satisfied with what's in this bill means that we probably did do it representing what you were saying and kind of thread the needle down the middle. A lot of us have been working on this cannabis policy for a number of years. It is really challenging. Um, and and I, I, I appreciate both sides of that perspective. And I've tried to walk a line in the middle and, and make sure we do hear from voices that don't agree with me, don't agree with uh, positions on any side of the, the kind of spectrum of, of the debate, but um, these are really challenging kind of questions, no doubt about it. Um, so, uh, Representative Hanko. Thank, thank you. I just want to make something really crystal clear. I am not opposed to the medical registry program at all. I just don't feel that we're the people to be legislating the medical side of it. Thank you. I was, the time's probably passed, but I just wanted to, when you're talking about the history or had some questions, is that when the um, program was originally adopted, it was, so there had been a study committee, legislative study committee that recommended it, and then it took a couple of years for it to pass. And when it was originally adopted in 2004, the only conditions that were qualifying um, were uh, cancer, um, HIV and AIDS, and MS. And, um, and you had to have been diagnosed uh, with, those, with, with one of those conditions and have essentially exhausted all other treatments. 
So they had the medical provider had to say, oh, they've done this and they've done that, and they still have not gotten relief from that. And so they so it was quite restrictive at the beginning. And then over the years, it's just gradually changed a little bit. So you know, I've been um, here for 25 years and been doing this these laws, all the drug laws since then. So uh, Every year I draft bills where somebody's saying, okay, how about Crohn's? There's, you know, 17 states that allow Crohn's as a qualifying condition, and here's the studies for that, and, and then there's bills for that. And so it's just gradually been expanded over over time and changed, you know, slightly. Um, but it, it's, it has been very in incremental over the last 20 years. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cooper Crohn. Record this is the last time I was. <laughs> um, is there uh, following up on a comment that somebody made? Uh, is there a reason, either in license or tax statute, that an individual with a card could not go into a retail establishment and buy tax free? And so there's a number of our retailers are actually saying, I will pay the tax uh, for you. There, you. I think it's a legislative decision that has to be made. Um, I think it's what? Uh, mm -hmm. What's that? You think it's what? A legislative decision that would have to be made uh, for a person with a medical card to get a tax waiver uh, at an adult recreational store. The card store. number? The card is numbered, yes. It's like I'm going to an auto parts store and buy one thing and pay a tax and buy another thing not based on a business. Uh, mm -hmm. Just seems customer friendly to be able to allow people to use the outlet that they or if it's closer and more convenient. Blah, blah, blah. So that that's a policy that's one of those big bucket of asks that was was in the, the list from some advocates on different you know from different stakeholders in this whole cannabis discussion that um, you know I think deserves a conversation in the future. I, I, the idea that if you have a medical card that you maybe could um, use a adult use retail having to go to a medical dispensary. But I think one of the reasons why we're not driving there right now is that we're concerned about the health of the medical dispensary system too, and making too many changes too fast with these two parallel places where you can get cannabis. Uh, well, I, would consistent. I would suppose the product offer is somewhat different. It, it is. And, and in fact, um, you know, one of the things that we did in our rules is said, if you are a medical dispensary that wants to play in both the adult use and the medical, that you need to maintain a minimum three month supply for all of your patients so that um, the patients really are held harmless because um, there are products that are available on the medical side that just either because of there's no profit, there's no market for them on the adult, like high, very high CBD, very low THC products or things that have certain cannabinoids in them that just people don't want on the, on the adult use side, mm -hmm. um, but are very therapeutic for people um, with PTSD or something along those lines. Um, and, and there's obviously a high THC solid concentrates as well. Um, so, you know, we said, if you're gonna have both, and so far I think all the one of the companies is playing in both the adult use and the medical use. They're, main, they're holding the patients harmless currently by maintaining those products that really, if you're a for-profit corporation, you might not stock, you know, you wouldn't really have it on your adult use, in your adult use. Well, there's something to talk about at some point. Yeah, I don't think this will be the last time we think about the no. interplay between no, the two markets. I don't think this subject is going to go away. I <laughs> know, I think not. Uh, Representative Hickman. Sure. Uh, I guess I'd first like to start off saying how much I appreciate Chair Pepper's efforts in keeping a lid on this program. It's, it's uh, you know, I've, I've seen him over the years and, and it over the years. Um, I haven't supported the initiative in the past and, and won't be in regards to some of these changes. Um, 
I know that the Cannabis Control Board has abilities to hold the line or hold, whether it's growers, retail, you name it, uh, uh, task, and they, they've done it with a light touch at first, and I can understand that. You know, it's a fledgling, I guess that's the word, right? Fledgling industry. Uh, but I hope that um, down the road, for sure, that um, they, they tighten up. Because again, I think the other states that uh, I've uh, heard and, and heard testimony from and uh, so on, uh, they're always pushing the envelope. The, the industry is always pushing the envelope. And you do have to keep ahead of it. And when I, again, read things from, um, you know, the Memorial Valley uh, Health Group that's uh, in, in constant uh, um, discussions with law enforcement and law enforcement says that the only thing that they can uh, enforce is underage use and uh, none of the other issues of public cons uh, public consumption and and so on you know it sounds like there's a, a judicial system issue there as well but um, ag again coming back to whether it's Colorado whether it's New York um, with the um, illegal, uh, activities that are that are going on that aren't being stifled is a concern to me, and I and I just I you know uh, Representative Merwicki talked about an individual <clears throat> with pain that had helped uh, when this uh, initially uh, was um, considered. There was a young mom who came out from I believe Boulder, Colorado, on her own, and she told the horror stories of her son who. Uh, got involved with dabbing and was at an institution in Texas. Um, her family couldn't go to a movie theater anymore in Boulder without, you know, the, the smell of of marijuana. Uh, there was uh, shootings down the street um, from from her home in regards to uh, the illicit market and the, the cartels that were still, if not as much, maybe more in the area. So those sorts of things um, really have a concern to me and. Uh, I've got to hand it to you to now, now that you're, you're you're doing as good a job as you can, but I think I think it's going to have to be uh, stepped up a little bit on some of the enforcement. Yeah, yeah I just I take your point, and I would just say we recently publicized because uh, the case is now closed, the agreement has been signed, a very serious violation um, that we uh, initiated. Um, you know, someone. You know, we may, may be taking a kind of education first approach for unintentional actions. I mean, this, these are brand new regulations for everyone, you know, but there's certain things that people should know better. You know, there's certain things that just cross the line between unintentional mistake to kind of flagrant violations. And, you know, one was a person who crossed state lines, went down to New York and sold cannabis and posted the thing to Facebook or social media. And um, that person got a twenty thousand dollar fine and a six week suspension. And um, you know we're 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 balancing the needs of the people that we've asked to come in and uh, to this market. They've never been subject to this level of regulation before or any regulation before. Um, there's a lot of people that want that are trying very hard to be compliant, and then there's people that are not. Um, and you know we're trying to take the education first approach with the former, and you know. We are cracking down on the ladder, but it's, it's, it, you know, people are challenging the board, you know, they're challenging our advertising restrictions. They're trying to see how we respond very much like raising a child, which by the way, I have to go, I, I really apologize, but I have to go pick up my son from childcare at 3.30 and I'm watching the clock tick down. Uh, they charge by the minute if they are not there at 3.30. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I can call in if you'd like, but I really do need to. I, I think we have pretty much wrapped our work up on this bill. So, I, Chair Pepper, I really appreciate the time you've given us today. I know it was a really tough child care day. And, you know, the child care folks, I believe your wife's involved in uh, <laughs> advocacy around that. Uh, it's kind of case in point. So, please uh, go get your kids. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for, again, you know, Feel free to stop me in the halls or call me or any questions that you have. I'm always you know, close by. Representative No, no, no. I'm, I'm trying to close it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, ditto to 
everything everyone was saying. Actually, I think that there's a lot of good points. Um, I just wanted to share one perspective, which for me, it, um, I feel like we sort of talk about like there's not enough evidence to show X, Y, Z harms a lot of times. But then on the other hand, um, me, I don't see us holding that same um, standard for when we're saying something's like safe or okay for X, Y, Z um, conditions as often. And so that's where I'm kind of concerned because I think, you know, from the government perspective, that's what I see as like my role is to, I'm absolutely sure something is safe or something. I don't feel like I should say that. Um, so I'm struggling on this bill because I don't think it's, you know, I think there's some good things in there and a lot of hard work was done, but. I guess I'd say that this bill still has some miles to go mm -hmm. and what we're always balancing out with any of the, the controlled substances and, you know, the reason this is, this, this is, was in GovOps and that we now have, you know, the DLL. And so there's sort of a nexus here that's in this committee now with, with these controlled substances that the state is involved in regulating. And it's always this balance between, we know that there are these activities that are happening, that people consume alcohol, that people gamble, that people use cannabis recreationally. And the spectrum that we all, where we all fall on the line of, should the state prohibit activity? Should it control and regulate that activity? Should it just allow people to do what they want to do and let the chips fall where they may? We're all going to fall on different places on that spectrum. And I think, Representative Eugene, your particular um, public health perspective is really valuable here. And I, um, it challenges me in my feeling of being a little bit more of like a harm reduction slash libertarian person <laughs> when it comes to some of these behaviors um, is to say, what is our role? I mean, it's, it's about the framing for this. Is it about, uh, and, and then the question is, if, if our job here is to try to keep the public safe, I think having uh, a reasonable, healthy retail market, I was convinced over the last few years of doing work on, on cannabis in this committee and, and outside of here with local questions about this stuff, um, that we would be better off having people have a well-regulated, well-functioning retail market that you know had consumer protections. And um, this bill, doesn't make any big, huge changes to that. Um, it, it is, there are some pretty significant tweaks to the policy, a new type of licensee, for instance, I think is, um, is not gonna transform the market, but it's definitely a, a tweak. Um, but, I, but I think that thing of how do we make the, keep the public safe with this particular thing, I don't know if we can ever be, if we, if we ever can get to the place where we're like absolutely sure um, and so we try to be cautious as, as we do this and, and we'll keep checking back in. All right, I think we beat this one. <laughs> yeah, Representative Cooper. Mr. Chair, <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to vote out of your most studious government operations committee, page 270, in this later summary. All right, so that'll be draft number 2.1 at the timestamp of 1.17 p.m. <laughs> Representative Merwicki. Um, I wonder if we could see a clean copy of the bill. Without the, I mean, without the, without the highlights? With, with that, well, there's a lot that struck. Does that stay in the bill, the struck? You say if you remove all the, okay. Yeah, the only thing, I, so I just went out and there's there's three places that are highlighted and those yep. are the changes from the previous okay. version. Okay. And I just took out the highlighting. Um, so, and I'm gonna send a clean copy over to Andrea right now, if you wanna see yeah. it, but it, the only difference would be that I'm removing the yellow highlighting. Oh, the highlights, right. But the struck language, you know, all of that is just, okay. you know, the repeal. Language. That's because yes, we're on the board, and so all that stuff yeah. is, kind of, yeah, it, it is a messy looking first section. I totally agree. <laughs> I think we have to keep it, we have to keep 
that in there in order to do the repeal right of the advisory michelle we would have to keep the correct so to, yes yeah i mean there's other ways we can get around that but you want people to be able to see what you're getting rid of so representative rowicki do you want to see a version without the highlights before we move it okay all right any further discussion all right the clerk shall call over. Representative Byron. Yes. Representative Boyden. Yes. Representative Pango. No. Representative Morgan. No. Representative Cooper of Burlington. Yeah. Representative Maricki. Yeah. Representative Chase. Yes. Representative Waters Evans. Yes. Representative Cooper of Randolph. Yes. Uh, Representative Nugent. No. Representative Higley. No. Representative McCarthy. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, I will be reporting this bill. I think that thus wraps up our work on this bill. Um, so the, the uh, really appreciate everybody's work on this. I know was, today especially was a lot of uh, talking about Canvas policy. So we can hopefully uh, put that aside and switch over to switch gears to other things. Uh, the last thing on the agenda today, and I think we're, um, we've got to give attorney Devlin time to get on some work in Senate GovOps. So we're going to take a 15 minute break uh, and then come back at 345. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome back to the late afternoon session of the House GovOps and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, we are resuming our work here to pick up a bill that we took a little testimony on yesterday, H-178, which is an act relating to commissioning Department of Corrections personnel as notaries public. Um, so uh, Attorney Devlin is here. And um, Tim, could you take us on a quick, uh, just breeze back through this bill so we just get back up to where we were yesterday? <laughs> sure. So the amendments to existing law are um, very minor. <laughs> Uh, and, but uh, I guess I should just start by saying that the, this bill proposes to add persons employed by the Vermont Department of Corrections to the list of persons who can be commissioned as notaries public to perform notarial acts <clears throat> within the scope of their official duties and exempted from all regular requirements for notaries public. The pertinent uh, language is really in section one, and section two is just effective dates. Section 1 amends Title 26 PSA, Section 5305, specifically, uh, which is, sorry, it's titled exemptions, specifically subsection A and 1, sorry, uh, where are we here? Um, uh, 2B, sorry, halfway th through page 2. And you'll see that there is an enumeration of law enforcement related uh, employees. And the new language starting in line 12 would read subdivision B, law enforcement related. <clears throat> Persons employed as law enforcement officers certified under 20 VSA chapter 151, who are non-certified constables, or who have been employed by a Vermont law enforcement agency, the Department of Public Safety, the Fish of Fish, sorry, the Department of Public Safety, of Fish and Wildlife, of Motor Vehicles, of liquor and lottery, new language of corrections, or of children and families, the office of the defender general, the office of the attorney general, or a state's attorney or sheriff. The other modified language at the top of page three, page three is um, degendering uh, amendments, replacing he or she with the person, and it's equivalent later on in that sentence. The rest of it has uh, been kept in to provide context. But the only other thing I think I should mention is that section two, the effective date, has this act taking effect upon passage. Are there any questions? This bill? It's a tough one. I guess uh, it's a, just the opposite in terms of complexity, I think, from the bill we uh, just discussed. So, um, but I think it, it will be uh, helpful from what we heard and not cause any challenges from OPR. And I actually think one of the best things that came out of our discussion yesterday is that um, 
Deputy Secretary Hibbert and Commissioner Demmel hopefully will be able to reduce the number of documents that even need to be notarized. So that might be uh, the functionally one of the best things that comes out of this. Um, I don't know that there's really much to talk about here. Um, so it's, I'll entertain a motion to move uh, the H-178 as introduced. So moved. President Hooper has moved that we uh, report favorably H-178. Uh, is there any further discussion? Is there anybody who feels like they would uh, be willing to give a pithy floor report on this one? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that just really got hurt. I mean, when you said that, I'm like, oh, right, it's yeah, in my ass. It's a very well-dated <laughs> ask. Yeah. 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 So you're, you're volunteering? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I <laughs> uh, appreciate that, Representative Waters. Okay. Okay. The shorter the bill, the more willing I am to for a pity flirt. For us both. Yeah. <laughs> You, you want to be prepared for a thorough interrogation, no, no matter uh, how long or short the bill is or appears to be. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, if there's no further discussion, um, I'll invite the clerk to call the roll. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Boyden? Yes. Representative Hango? Yes. Representative Morgan? Mm, yes. <laughs> Representative Hooper of Burlington? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Chase? Yes. Representative Water Seven? Yes. Representative Hooper of Randolph? Yes. Representative Nugent? Yes. Representative Hibley? Yes. Representative McCarthy? Yes. Thank you all very much for your diligent and hard work on both of our bills today, even though one was long and one was short. Um, so uh, Tim, thanks for joining us and uh, for your work as always. Uh, that concludes our business for today.